All right, hello, dog people. This is podcast Training Without Conflict number 23. And today's guest is Dr. Jennifer Zelix. We've been trying to, to talk or to meet for, for at least four or five years. Um, <laughs> I remember how it all started. I think it was something on social media and I was about to publish a book. And I think you were, you just published yours, um, the, the animal training one-on-one. I think that's, that was the time. And, and we had some really interesting conversations and here we are five years later, <laughs> finally <laughs> getting to talk to each other. Um, now, I'm gonna give a little introduction of who you are and what you've done. And I'm saying a little because I, I don't think I know anybody that has the, the resume that you have. I, know, I mean, you, you, you've been doing animals. It's not, it's not horses, it's not sea lions, it's not dogs, it's just animal training, period. And, and I guess the, that's why the animal training one-on-one uh, uh, really fits your, your, um, what you do. Um, so I'm gonna give a little intro and then you also uh, fill in some of the gaps because I know there is a lot. Um, at least 40 years of experience, animal behavior modification uh, presentations all over the world. 2014, the animal training one-on-one. Uh, uh, highly recommend the book. It's been it's actually one of the books that I used. Oh, that's nice. You've done the, you, you're, you're the owner of the Animal Training and Research International affiliated with California State University system. Um, you have a second book that came 2021, I think, The Mindful, uh, um, the Mindful Partners, The Zen Art and Science of Working with Animals. As I said, like I- incredible, vast experience of, of anything that has to do with animals from training to animal care to husbandry to competition veterinary procedures i mean it, it doesn't end like it's amazing like it's totally crazy and then of course you've been featured in in many documentaries and televisions national geographic tonight show dateline now you've done like, since at least what I can track, since the 1990, you've done numerous of presentations and papers of really, really interesting topics. And I, I have no idea how, how long this podcast will be, or we need to do another <laughs> one, or I need to come to California, <laughs> because it, it's also interesting. The one that I'm really interested in and I think it just goes like, I think we have a lot of common things we'll find out. But the giving animal a purpose, that was a 2016, you did something uh, as a keynote to uh, the annual Australian Behavior and Conditioning Conference. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure there, uh, you know, like your book, the, the late book, Mindfulness, fits right in, in that same thought process. Um, then the power of relationship, and like, like every single one, it sounds very interesting. And um, like your genuine interest in the animals and the interaction, and the behaviors kind of come secondary as something we do, but, but it's not about getting the behaviors like this, um, you know, cut and dry training. First of all, thank you so much. That was such a gracious and, um, well, very kind uh, introduction. And I have to say, really likewise, you know, your name has been floating around um, my mind and experience from dog trainers that really admire you, that have talked to me about you for years. So I feel really privileged and excited to get a chance to talk to you. I was thinking about this interview thinking, 
I wonder if I can interview him. You know, I'm always, after I wrote this Animal Training 101 uh, book, which is really, that first book is a, is really a textbook on yes. animal training. And I tried to be very um, uh, unsentimental and unbiased towards my presentation of the full art and science as much as I could find it across the industry in all the different places where people and animals uh, work together so that it's got it's sort of a practical um, uh, textbook yeah. that's organized according to goals. And then I looked at everything as a pros and cons kind of analysis. And I think you and I um, might see that pretty similarly, um, at least as I, as I understand it, but I'm always looking to collect um, more uh, changes to the, to the book because it's a living, breathing thing. And people are inventing people like you at the top are inventing important uh, techniques and um, deeper understanding uh, all the time that needs to be incorporated. So take this as a, as a invitation to edit the book. I'm going to do another edition. So <laughs> I'd be happy to collect things that are missing. Anyways, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool adoration society here in this podcast. So that's, that's what I would say. Yeah. I think we, we definitely will go back and forth. I, I, I would love that because, um, yeah, I, I don't really want this to be a one-sided interview. I think, I think we have so much to talk that, Hopefully, I, I keep some sort of track and don't forget some important things. But, um, <laughs> I think uh, you asked me um, uh, about my school. So I, yes. I started running a, um, a animal care center at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories at, at California State University. I teach at CSUMB, Cal State Monterey Bay. And I still do that now. Um, but during COVID, the center um, got closed down. So we had animals at this center. We've had, you know, domestic animals like horses and dogs, but we primarily had exotic animals, seals and sea lions a lot and birds. Um, and previous to that, I worked at like big zoos and I go and consult around for zoos. So I have quite a lot of um, different toes or irons in the fires of, of different animal training communities. So what has happened is the actual center itself is closed. The online animal training academy associated with animal training and research as a community is still open. And I have students all over the world that run their own programs of different um, animal types. So I'm still teaching workshops and I'm teaching online. Um, but I'm going into a sort of a semi-retirement phase. <laughs> well, try, <laughs> trying to. <laughs> I'm moving to the UK, actually. Uh, yeah. I'm moving to Europe. Where, where are you? Do you? Have you thought about it yet? Or? I'm going to Oxford uh, less than a month from now, actually. My, oh, wow. I'm living in an empty house. I'm right now, I'm in California, but I'm in an empty house. All of my stuff is making its way through the Panama Canal <laughs> oh, wow. to, to Oxford. And if I'm lucky, I can I can uh, get a uh, at least a part time teaching position there. Um, using so, the connections so I have. if I if I have to see you, I have to come to UK now. I thought California yeah, well, was still. Or, or we can arrange some kind of uh, collaborative journey on our various. Because yes. I know you travel all around. You never know. We could end up at a workshop someplace together. So yes, that would yes, be fun, yes. wouldn't it? Very true. Um, how I know this is like almost a. a cliche question but it it's always an interesting one because uh, everybody has a little different path of how they got involved in in so how, how did it all start for you like what did the whole animal love it um it's actually a pretty good story <laughs> <laughs> i um and i tell the story a little bit in my new book mindful partners but uh I'll, so i'll be brief um but it started for me very, very young. I got really lucky. And I think it, it helps because I, um, I took, well, what happened was I, I was a young girl who loved animals. So let's say I was age eight or something. And a lot of times when, when that happens, 
And my family didn't have a dog. Okay. So that would have been the natural place. But what often happens, and I think you probably know, is is it you get into horseback riding. Right. Little girls get into yeah. horseback riding if they have if they love horses. And that's what I did. And, you know, the the instructors tell you how great you are and how you're natural and all this kind of stuff. So I thought I was going to be the next Annie Oakley or whatever. You know, I thought I was I was headed for you know a career in this. And then I developed a small allergy to horses. It was really minor. Like I work with horses today, but my mother was an immunologist and she wouldn't let a young girl go through, she wouldn't let me Mm. because I was young and my immune system was developing. She didn't want me exposed to the horses. So she cut me off and there was a big fight (laughs) between her and me because I was pissed. I was going to be the next greatest horse trainer. Right. And uh, so what she did, she was so loving. She found, we were part of what's called friends of the national zoo. I lived in the East coast and the Smithsonian national zoo had a program for the public. And she found a course being taught by, that was right when animal training was hitting zoos. In fact, I think there were something like five zoos in the entire United States Mm. that had a real formal animal training program. And they had just hired a head trainer who came in from Scripps um, in San Diego, who had been working with marine mammals. And she was teaching this course on animal training. And it was basic bridge and targeting, which at that time, so this would have been like uh 1978 79 something like that so it was a long time ago and uh that was revolutionary at that time i mean today everybody knows about it but that in 1979 that was revolutionary and especially to take it into the exotic animal world and especially zoos aquariums were a little ahead of zoos and so um, I took this class with her and I was young and I was I was pretty precocial. I was, you know, I was able to take in the information and I just loved it. And I was like the best student, even though the class was designed for like um, high school students. And you couldn't volunteer technically until you were like 14 or something like that. But mm-hmm. I was so keen. And so I said, what can I do? You know, please let me do something um, at the zoo. And she, she was she was trying to be kind. And I think she thought I would just naturally go away. And so what she did was she assigned me the job of doing research notes on different collections of animals. So she sat me down in front of, you know, one day it would be the spectacle bears and then it would be the wolves and then it would be the otters. And and I, I sat there and I took, you know, nine-year-old person's notes just just you know useless kind of animal observations but i did that for very dedicatedly for like six months and i had to take two subways and all this to get to the zoo so i was really really dedicated and i think it it made this um big difference watching collections of animals for hours at a time interacting with each other Um, I think in the end was like learning to read body language. You know how when you're younger, you have more of a facility for language learning in general. So this was like a different form of language learning. This is my hypothesis about it anyways, because the being able to go between species enabled me to kind of become a good listener or, you know, how they say reading behavior, reading the behavior of what's happening um, was a skill set that I learned kind of by accident, and I learned it going between animals. Anyways, I, I know uh, I've made this into a long story. Did now, she but like? Uh, but you said uh, uh, from, or, or or your mentor was from San Diego, but everything happened on the East Coast. Or she had been hired. Okay. Yeah, she she came over from from the aquarium industry uh-huh. and had just been <clears throat> hired at the zoo in Washington in Maryland. And eventually she let me start to volunteer. Like I can remember I, I was able to clean my first bucket, shh, you know, before you were supposed yes. to and, <laughs> and throw fish to the animals and stuff like that, you know, and help out cleaning up after bears and things. And I just stuck around and then they allowed me to be the primary trainer on a bunch of animals because wow. I was dedicated and hardworking. And so I worked at the zoo as part of my junior high and high school um, 
curriculum. We, we, my parents helped me to get the school to allow me to have uh, some of my courses, some of my hours. I could go to the zoo to work. So I worked at the zoo for seven years. And I started going to professional meetings when I was like 14 years old. I was making presentations on um, conditioning secondary reinforcers and secondary reinforcer preferences with different animals. And yeah, I, I started wow. quite, really? quite young. So I've been just doing it a long time. Yeah, I guess it's a really lucky to have a, somebody to kind of take you and, and bring you in like this. It's a, it doesn't happen. I don't know if that's yeah, even possible true. today to allow somebody at that young age to, to even have any access. Things are very different. Um, I agree. Yeah. Do you, is a, um, I, I'm now curious, like if I don't think I would ever know the name, but people probably would uh, like the, your mentors, uh, like her, the, my primary, the first person, this, this lovely lady who taught me was called Casey Cover. She's still a, a trainer today. You might recognize her name. Oh, I know She's Casey. She's got her own community. Yeah, Say I that know. Again? I, I do know Casey. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's so far long ago. Oh, look at that. Okay, so, wow. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, she does a lot of interesting <clears throat> things with dogs, with dog-on-dog um, dog aggression and... Yeah, we, so I, um, well, I don't even know how, uh, how did I meet her, but I know that after we met, we went together to one, uh, to one uh, workshop with, um, <clears throat> uh, what was their name, Tad, Tad Lachinak and... Oh, Fadless in it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. He and used to Angie. be Sea Worlds. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they had a, some, some workshop here in Clearwater, which is, you know, Florida where I am. And yeah, me and Casey went together to that workshop and then um, she brought a dog of hers. So we, we kind of played around a little bit. But that's crazy how, wow, that's totally crazy. Um, Oh, wow. Yeah, I know both of those people. That is a good friend of mine. Um, I guess that was a positive reinforcement workshop. Uh, he yes, would have been right. yes, yes, very much so. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you know how I, I am very much like you. I'm very open to anything and, and um, yeah, uh, and, and anything that there is something that I can get an idea or get inspired definitely going there. <laughs> um, it seems like it's working. You're very successful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, just like you, I mean, we're trying, trying to, to stay there and, and um, um, tell me, tell me with the book, the, the second book, cause it's a, I guess it's more of a, how, how we said the, the animal training one-on-one -on -one is really a, a very much kind of the book that I wanted to make. And by the way, I never did it. So that's why I never send you the book. <laughs> I know I promised okay. you. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, we basically, um, I hired somebody to kind of help me with my businesses. And they said, don't do the book. Open a school for training based oh. on the book. And so we, I, because I had it ready at the time, it was just ready to pretty much ready to be published. And that's kind of how it that and that, but I'm very happy to, to have the school and have the, what I collected throughout the years as a, a curriculum. And that's kind of how it ended. But your second- That's very much how oh. I wrote my book. Um, mm. I mean, I taught animal training at university to the people. So I went from Maryland, then I went to university at University of California, Santa Cruz. And um, I very quickly, because of a connection that Casey had with the, this was a marine laboratory, I, um, I ended up uh, being responsible for large collections of animals there, even as an undergraduate, because I had, I came in with like 10 years experience and they had graduate students, people who didn't know yeah. anything handling their animals. And so I, I basically developed a whole program of training, training the trainers 
and then I needed material. So I started teaching these courses and going to conferences and that kind of stuff. And I just over 20 years or something like that, I collected all these notes right. from essentially from um, trying to teach other people so that they could care for the animals that I was taking care of. And eventually I wrote it into a book when it got to a certain point, but you know, it, it, it like never stops. You keep collecting more right. information. So it's always going to be the book that was good enough at that. That was, that was the right book at that time, but it's not going to hold up because it, it is going to keep changing. That's, that's, I think a, an important thing. How, My second book is, I don't know how you uh, got to like, I, I, I did one book late nineties and I don't know, maybe I just, it was just too hard for me. And I, I don't think I can convince myself. If I do another book, I have to have a, I have to have an, you know, co-author or an editor that's really, really on top of things to make it very easy for me. Otherwise, I, I just don't know. Like, like, you, I mean, you, you had a good break between the two books. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. I did. It's so, hard. Right. It's very hard. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, the reason I'm moving to Oxford is because I went to use, there was an academic relationship between California State University and Oxford that allowed me to use their library system. That's Harry oh. Potter's library, by the way, oh, wow. just to be deep. Oh, wow. And so it, it, that helped enormously, but it took me years, even, even though I had been working on the material for 20 years, it took me maybe five years to write my first book something like that a long time a long time my so, second book yes. is people a lot of people don't want i mean someone like you at a very very top level wants a textbook on animal training and someone who's very very serious about animal training wants a textbook on animal training but a lot of people said could you give me the more simplistic um, <laughs> form, uh, you know, maybe just select some techniques that would be more straightforward. Um, so, and, and people asked about stories. They wanted stories of my life, stories with animals. So the second book is more um, focused on, uh, you know, a, a kind of every person's experience with animals. It's, it's a, it's meant, it's not all the techniques. It's just a, you know, the, the sort of the principal foundational um, viewpoints. And also what happened to me was I, I got involved in mindfulness. I started meditating and um, I'm really interested in mindful psychology. And I was incredibly impressed with the parallels between effectively these wisdom contemplative traditions that have taught people how to improve their their mind yeah. their behavior through their mind and how similar that that psychology is through all the psychologies i mean these are all basically um the origin of wellness and and how to get there um and that's really what we what we do with animals as well in a sense we're looking for um, trying to find a way that both beings in the situation can get what they need in the most, um, you know, kindly and wholesome manner possible. Um, but understanding the complexity of that situation that both parties are bringing to the table. So, yeah, so this has got a heavy mindfulness, um, wisdom, cool. contemplative uh, viewpoint, as well as a lot of Jennifer stories in there. So, so is it, Again, kind of animal training, or is it geared towards more uh, horses? Yeah, it's animal training. An animal. <laughs> it's always animal. It's called the Zen art and science of working with animals. I love it. It does, it does take you on the full arc. You know, I talk about the bridge stimulus, and I talk about the ABCs, um, and I talk about all of the basic operant techniques and um, the gift of fearlessness, you know, those kinds of things. But I do talk about it from, uh, yeah, a less science-y. I mean, it still has a lot of science, but it, it's got a more a softer um, Oh, I mean, it's tone. perfect, perfect approach with, you know, mindfulness and, and kind of the same simplicity yeah. of, hey, this is, this is what it's about. <laughs> It doesn't have to be complicated. 
Um, yeah, that's right. The core principles. <laughs> People like you who are really interested in, I've listened to some of your podcasts who are really interested and nerdy about all the science that's out there. You know, probably the Animal Training 101 is, you know, is more the book uh, or that direction. And, and, and I'm yeah, sure for you sure. Have. For sure. It's all, it's all. How, how, when you, I mean, how is that book? Because you're in a, in a special circle of, of you know, like just just with the with all the different including exotic animals and and from horses to dogs and and who knows what else but when you wrote the book and and as as you said you you really you you had to make it as a textbook and you had to say and present uh, all around picture of what learning is and and what are the different nuances and so like this is where I get a lot of um, yeah um, negativity comes out anytime I try to talk about negative reinforcement or some form of using of aversion and it turns out into a big uh, uh, arguments of being humane or ethical and so on like I'm curious did you did you get any negative feedback because you had to go that route and you didn't just touch on the positive side I definitely experienced the negative feedback yeah <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean we all do you it's for one thing I mean I, I think I waited to publish my book for a long time because one of my um, uh, friends who's a dog trainer, actually, Tennille Williams in Australia, she she said to me this phrase, which I hear is out there, um, but I've been using it a lot now. The only thing two trainers can agree on is what the third one is doing wrong, right? right. And right. animal trainers are, are oddly um, bickersome in that way, very, very critical, I think because it's always been more of an art than a science, but even the people who are interested in the science tend to wield it as though somehow it's an absolute. Um, science is not absolute like that. Science is always percentage and probability and only based on how it's been tested. And, you know, it's very difficult to test animal training strategies in a laboratory setting that apply widely to um, our conventional and practical usages, you know, like one of the things, for example, in, in the science side, that is always very difficult for me. And I wonder what you think about this. The first thing they do in scientific investigations is cut out the relationship between the trainer and the animal. That is the number one thing they control against. Yeah. Yeah. It's Which, a, this, you're you know, so even right. with dog studies, they have in some <laughs> random person comes in for 20 minutes Correct. and does something with shelter dogs or something like Correct. that. It, you know, it's not, it's not true to what I think a lot of the major stuff, imagine you were doing it that way with human beings. Correct. Like that doesn't compute. Of course, trust and comfort is a huge part of psychological, um, uh, I processes. think that's where it's, uh, we're, we're, you know, this is a one big part where we still uh, kind of stuck in the Skinner box, so to speak, where it's like a light and a click and a sound and, a, and, and that emotional interaction is completely disregarded from, and, and it's so, well, lately, everybody's talking about emotions and relationship, but it's almost almost uh, um, becoming a, like a just talking salad like it's not even you, you're not even putting a meaning of what you what you're just saying the words because everybody talks like that but um relationship I mean I, I cannot imagine what do you do without and and even when we say relationship, people don't even pay attention because it's been said so many times. And what does that really mean? But ah, right there, I have an answer. But we need we need in a relationship we need trust, we need cooperation, we need willingness to interact together. We need all these things. It's not just very 
a, a blank word uh, relationship, right? And once we have all those in place, then the, the way uh, the, the whole learning interaction happens is very different than if you don't have that. So I'll, I'll let you give me your experience on this. Yeah, well, I'm a very relationship-focused person. In fact, it's one of the ways that I contemplate how I'm using, um, how, what techniques I'm using when and to what extent uh, I think about um, the relationship like a bank account. Uh, this, this comes from human psychology, um, but with yeah, a, a slight Yeah, you talk about this in the mindfulness book. I remember this. Yeah. I talk about it in both of my books because, um, yeah. but I do talk about it like a scientist. So here's how I would look at a relationship. The relationship from the perspective that we're talking is not how you feel about the animals. Let's put that to the side. Let's assume you're a grown up and you can deal with your own emotions. The relationship that we're talking about is the motivational potential that the animal has to how the animal animal perceives the human or human beings in the situation. And what is that um, based on? It's based on the cumulative value of all the interactions between the person and the animal. That is to say, it is constantly accumulating and um, it is constantly modifiable. We know this also from human beings and it is formed by the mechanism of classical conditioning. So what you're associated with rubs off on you. Highly valuable things rub off, highly negative things rub off. And, and the question, the reason a bank account works as a, as a, as a um, manageable way of thinking about it is to realize it's not just um, one deposit or one withdrawal that makes the right. whole thing, right? It's, it's, it has to do with do you have enough in the bank to make withdrawals, which you're going to have to make? Um, you're going to have to do things that the animal doesn't like. It's not possible in any relationship not to do that. And the question is, do you know, at what point do you do that and how do you do it and how can you skillfully do it and how can you compensate? And so that it's the balance on the account that really matters. Um, if you have a high balance, uh, you can you can generally um, first of all weather a lot of uh, bad you know negative experiences, but also you end up being valuable yourself. It, it, you know, on your own, you show up. This is something dog trainers take almost for granted because dogs have been largely bred if they have not, my experience anyways, is that if they have not had an abusive or problematic relationship with people, every dog you meet walks up to you and, and you're automatically a reinforcer. Yes. You yes. don't realize in the dog world how different that is than everybody else. That's not true to horses. It's not true to exotic animals. You, you are a built-in reinforcer and all you can do is build up or down from there. But it, it makes dogs like... You know, that's why they're man's best friend, quote unquote, because they, you know, basically you come preloaded. You've got preloaded software of positivity there. Um, yeah, in a way, in a way, it's also like uh, like kids at school, you know, they they we always would have a, a preferred teacher that we're looking forward to go to that class instead of another class. And and the reasons are quite similar. And when you have that kind of interaction with a teacher that you like to be around, now you get their, they get your attention. That's and, right. And now and, we, and you're much more interested in trying harder. Now we yeah. go somewhere. And if you've got someone you trust, you're more, you're more willing to go through scary things or work harder um, to try to figure out what they want. I mean, everything about, so, to me, when I originally started teaching people to train animals, I said, if you, you break this into two simple things, this goes back to like Plato or Aristotle, one of those two, I can't remember. But uh, there's two basic things when you want to get somebody to do what you want them to do. The first is you need to be able to explain to them how to do it. There's a whole bunch of grab bag techniques of that. 
This, the second is the more important thing. You have to convince them to care. You have to convince them to want to do they it. They want to. That's the motivational side. So communication and motivation are kind of the, these two, two parts of this equation. The, the game is won and lost in motivation because an animal who wants to do what you want it to do will figure it out even if you're crappy at explaining yes. it. Yes. You know, the classic, like, Clever Hans story. Clever Hans could do all this magic, you know, you know that story? Yes, with the of course. Counting horse. And the, the, the reason was the, the horse wanted to do what the owner wanted, and he was trying to figure out all the little subtle cues. It's just like that. The animal will work to try to figure it out if they care. So motivation in terms of a relationship is just such a valuable resource. Of course, you can also add in all sorts of other, you know, motivators. Uh, and they, those can be positive and negative motivators, um, positive reinforcement, and negative reinforcement motivators. Yes, we we definitely want to go there, too. But uh, I, I just. Some something just came into my mind comparing like the sea lions and the dogs, what, how, how different they are. Because every time I go to, like I tell you, the extent of my knowledge is going to any of the marine world parks and watching them before the show, how they train. I didn't care much about the show, but going right before the show when they do the training. And of course, it, it's a training, it, it makes sense, but I don't have that one-on-one -on -one interaction that you have. How different are the two, dogs and sea lions? I'd say they're awfully similar in many ways. Um, I mean, for one thing, just biologically, they have, they're, they're very closely related through the wolf ancestry. So wolf mm. goes to the ocean, becomes sea lion. Sea lion is the closest thing to a wolf. A sea, oh, and, wow. and in okay. fact- they're called sea wolves in many cultures. Um, so they have a canid lineage. The, I mean, if you look at the skull morphology, right. all sorts of elements, even the barking noise, the, 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 a lot of their social elements, they don't hunt as a pack quite the same way as a, as a wolf pack does. They don't stay quite as close in that sense. But um, but they definitely have a very sociable nature. And, and they're they playful, still, right? They're yeah, play. very playful. So I would say they're they're peas in a pod. I mean, it's the you know obviously a, a wolf and a dog also you know don't have uh, some things in common, but if you've talked to both, you notice the similarities. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say that whole group um, that those close to the the wolf like ancestry canid ancestors feel very similar. They feel intellectually similar. They feel curious. Um, they're more, um, yeah, I think they're more confident, playful. Um, they're, they're, I think they're more Like I feel they will be my choice if I got to pick uh, uh, that type of animal to, to work with. That, for sure, that would be my choice. <laughs> You're right. Um, I mean, well, it was mine, right? I, I, yeah. That's kind of, I'm most famous for working with sea lions. Um, even so, working with sea lions out in the open ocean, free releasing them back into their wild environment. Um, and they, they stayed with us. And, and I think of that a lot like how the wolf became the dog. You tell know, me, they tell saw me more about this. Say, say tell, again? tell me more about the, the open ocean and the rehab and sending and, and, uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, I was doing two projects. One was on looking at um, diving physiology, where we wanted to add some depth. Um, we had the sea lions trained to do um, controlled dives in and out of chambers and wearing heart rate monitors to to look at their physiology. Mm. So part of the work was to was to study them in that context, but. The more famous one was that we put uh, video cameras on the back of them. This was before there was digital cameras, so it was really difficult. So these giant VHS, right. and then we got the, oh like the first generation <laughs> digital cameras, these huge things. 
critter cams. We were, that, that's how I was working with National Geographic. And um, the idea was that the sea lions would go out and study aspects of the wild environment, particularly whales, just to do a um, circumnavigation of the whale so that we would know what sex it was, um, as well as to place like tags and, and things like that. So we were working right here off um, Monterey with sea lions that we released um, and they would be wearing this equipment uh, wow. following animals. It, it, the equipment was just, it, you know, if we had held out for another like 10 years and now the, these little lipstick right. digital cameras, right. but the equipment was so big, it was just this, this huge encumbrance. We do have great footage of them chasing dolphins and chasing whales and um, but it was it was too expensive and problematic uh, to make it work at the time that we did. I think we could do it. Uh, we could do it now. But yeah. So how was, did you was, get uh, them once incredible. they're in the water? How do you get them back? Well, what happens to your dogs when you let them go? Why do they come back to you? Okay. Amazing. <laughs> I mean, you oh, have an amazing. you have an ad, added bonus that right. they are domestic animals, True. but they can run away. You know that as well as me, right? True. So they make a choice, and that choice is based on and informed on their relationship. Yeah. It's it's based on a pros and cons analysis that they make about um, whether it's uh, whether it's better to stay with me or it's better to go out into the wild. And and actually, that's always been one of the things that I have pointed out to people in terms of, of the importance of the relationship bank account yeah. is that, you know, look, I could take the animals. They would meet other wild sea lions who, who they hated, by the way. They were so angry to meet the wild sea lions because they thought the wild sea lions were going to get in on their action or whatever, you know, <laughs> like, these are my humans. Get right. your own, you oh, know? my God. <laughs> that kind of thing. But you know, we didn't we didn't take brand new animals from scratch and release them back out into the wild. We we conditioned them and trained them and developed language with them and developed bonds with them, and slowly slowly moved them out to sea. And um, and we did it in small approximations. Exactly how I bet you could do it too. I bet you can yeah. imagine how you would do it. Yeah, you yeah. In small bits. It just the 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 whole idea of. Uh when you say open ocean, you know, it's just kind of, it's a little more extreme, at least it sounds like, because um, I think it was even last night I was watching something, you know, how you get in on YouTube and you just from one thing to the next. And so there was a, there was a guy that rescued a, a baby squirrel and he fed it and raised it. And finally it's like, okay, I'm gonna try to get it to go out and leave its own life and it just kept coming back and it's like okay well then you're gonna stay as long as you want but at any moment you want and don't come back that's your choice and and so he still at least now he still has the squirrel going in and out and it's like the same thing um so yeah um it's just that yeah. whole idea of a dolphin or a sea lion or any of them in the open ocean. It's just a little bit. It just sounds very like something more there, which it shouldn't be. It, it's still. Well, it, uh, I mean, let's face it. It does. I think it's a testimony to right to how you train them, and right. I don't think you, you know, if you were using a lot of negative oh, yeah. uh, work with them, I think that would. That would. Uh, push I remember. Back, I remember dog trainers that would. They would bring a dog on a training field, and they will be looking at all the gates, make sure that everything is closed because. The dog did not want to, and it's like that picture is still in my head, so fresh. But um, there you go. Th there is that. It's not. It's not as common anymore, but it's still there. And, and who cares if we can train an animal when it doesn't want to be with you. It just doesn't want to be with you. Like, it's like, yeah. what, what are we doing? You missed the, big, the biggest the picture. Really? 
and oh. horses are horses are very different because again like a I mean they are prey so they they are more twitchy right to to begin with now when you do <coughs> I guess uh, um, I was thinking about condition reinforcers because I mean you've done dogs and horses and marine world and, and tigers and who uh, what I don't know what you have not trained so I'm sure you have used a lot of different from whistles to clickers to verbal how what, where do you stay with like how do you see all the different condition reinforcers are they any particular for particular species or what do you thoughts and beliefs are on that Gosh, that's a great question. Um, I think it's a matter of personal choice. I think, so here I want to pin you down because conditioned reinforcer is a big term. And I think you're meaning in this case to, to talk about it as a bridge stimulus, right? Not just, yeah. so conditioned reinforcers could also be like, for example, with exotic animals, petting is a conditioned reinforcer right, right. or eating ice cubes or something that's not normal okay. or, or, you know, play could even be a conditioned reinforcer sometimes. So, um, but in this case, you're talking about it as a communication stimulus, Correct. a very specific one, right? Okay. So uh, as a marker, um, I think the properties of a marker need to be, it needs to stand out from the environment clearly and not end up being uh, showing up all the time accidentally, obviously, because then it would be blurred in its conditioning. Um, and this I'm pointing that out because it depends on what species you're working with, what noises are going to be in that animal's right. environment. Um, and then, it, it, you know, depending on what species you're working with, um, how loud does that sound need to be? Like, how far away are you going to be? I was working with animals where you know, I might be hundreds of yards away from them. Mm -hmm. I needed something that was going to carry a lot of times. Plus the, the, um, the water land interface, you know, just think about like splashing next to your ears. You, you needed something that was going to, was going to pull up, but there's other situations where they need subtlety. What they need is no one hears the sound, you know, because you're in competition or, um, or there's some kind of performance element to it, and it's inelegant to be making uh, those kinds of um, really dramatic uh, yeah. markers. So I think it really has to be according to the need. Um, but my bottom line is I like, uh, I would always want a verbal um, bridge stimulus with any animal I worked with, if I also had, a, but I often had more than one. Um, I, and, and pretty much, yeah, I think I always have more than one uh, bridge stimulus conditioned so that I can work with a variety of scenarios. Mm -hmm. There are certain animals that hear better, like dolphins are famously hearing better in this really high frequency range. And so people have a tendency to use whistles with them, but it's really obnoxious because if you're, if you're just scan and capturing, if you're free shaping something and the animal does something beautiful and you want to um, you want to bridge it at that moment, you don't want to have to grab the whistle and put it in your mouth because there, there's a latency there. Right. So a lot of even even <clears throat> the best dolphin trainers will learn to list, whistle by mouth so that they have a backup um, in case of whistle malfunction or they lost their whistle or got their whistle. I just don't like gear that I don't have to have. If I can just, you know, it doesn't get dirty. I don't have to buy yep. it. I'm not going to lose it. The animal's not going to, you know, um, strangle me with it or take it from me or swallow it or, but I work with a lot of different kinds of animals where that is a real possibility, you know, where, where, you know, I've watched people like some, some crazy sign trucking. <laughs> I've watched people drop clickers and animals snap them up and swallow them. Um, so it depends. I mean, that wouldn't happen with a chicken, right? right. And it probably wouldn't happen with a dog, but um, it might happen with a wombat or a sea lion or, you know, so the, it's, it depends on what you're training. Okay. Um, yeah. Like I, what, what is your feeling about that answer? Mm. How do you feel? 
with D. Yeah, I, I mean, probably similar. If, if anything, I would add to this is that um, I like, I, I, I also like verbal, but I, I feel like there is a bonus point of adding some feeling to saying good versus good versus like something extra comes out or like there is levels of good right ah, and right. and uh, at least the dogs i think they are very keen on oh you really like yeah. that one right yeah. um so to where um i i mean i in, in my school i encourage and we we train with clicker and and um, you know but I always see it as a, a little bit of a downfall. Like the good sides we know, yes, it's salient, yes, it's, it, there is all this. But uh, it kind of almost forces the trainer to stay in that Skinner box and focus on behaviors and mark behaviors without personality and, and feelings in there. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. you touch, I click, you get paid. You do, I click, you get paid. But that moment of, wow, that's my boy, right? That that's, goes a long way. Yeah. I've never seen a clicker trainer, a really good one anyways, not respond with a secondary verbal bridge when they're in that jackpot moment. That, I mean, mm. that's one of the reasons. I, I actually think, like Clever Hans, that clicker trainers in general almost always have a also a backup verbal bridge whether they intentionally co co uh, conditioned it or not and this principle that we're talking about that you're talking about very elegantly and i completely agree with i call this differential reinforcement stimuli so the reason the one of the reasons i use a verbal bridge is because you can um, modulate a verbal bridge into a variety of even more nuanced meanings that you can condition to, um, as long as you do condition them now. You know, it's not by magic. It still has to have the same kind of associative implication. Right. So I think of it like, uh, like on a grading system, you've got like good, very good, and excellent, and they pay accordingly. So you might have your kind of your basic good, and then you have your a little bit better good, and then you've got your jackpot good that that is associated with the jackpot. And yes. and that that level of finesse where you can provide that information as the behavior is happening helps the feedback loop for the animal understanding exactly how profound that moment was. And it it seems like it does provide um, a lot of encouragement, a lot of joy. Um, to the animals who it's conditioned to. So yeah. I, I think it's really, um, it's a tool I wouldn't want to live without. I guess the clicker has, you know, it's a pros and cons situation. It's got, its greatest strength and its greatest weakness are kind of linked together. It's always the same. So it's quite precise. That makes it easy to condition. Um, and a lot of people feel self-conscious about using too much verbal with mm -hmm. their animals or they're in competitions and that's not working for them. Um, so I understand it. And some people are like really um, uh, good with their hands, like they're like video game players or something. So maybe they learn the clicker easier than they learn right. using their voice in terms of timing wise. And so when you're teaching people, I've heard 100%, that. hundred um, percent, yeah. I've heard that, but I'll tell you what, the people in my school, they learned on clickers and verbals and had no trouble. Um, yeah, and for also sure. I've heard people I... say, um, oh, sorry, uh, one more point on this. Yeah, this, yeah. Is a, this is a really interesting topic. I intended to do a research project on this that I never completed, but I'll give you a little data that I did get on this because I trained some baby sea lions on both the clicker and the verbal oh my god. simultaneously. Training baby um, sea lions. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like puppies. <laughs> they oh were like puppies, god. you know? And so they were, and because be, you have the overshadowing problem, you probably know this, like whatever bridge you learn first 
is the one true God, right? It's the one ring that rules them all. And if you if you're too late in adding in the second bridge, it will take a while because the animal isn't listening for it. They know there's a bridge, and it's not that one. So um, so it really helps to to condition multiple bridge stimulus or reward markers. It, it helps to put those in kind of early yes. on, and, yes. and like a child learning two languages, they learn it no yeah. problem, right? Yeah. Or learning um, skiing, you you make a left and a right turn right away. You don't just make two lefts. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> yes, and I'm sure you could come up with a lot more of those examples too. Because yeah, that's that's right. So we did this with the clicker and the verbal, and the problem was just the practicality. Now working with um, exotics, there's a lot of safety issues. There's a lot of gear, you know, you're carrying buckets of food. It's so having something you have to have in your hand is incredibly annoying. Um, and especially in those early phases where the animal, you know, they're, yes, they're like it's all over. Me. Yeah. They're all over the place and you're really, you need to bridge at the right moment. You can't have to be looking, you know, but also you have to be protecting yourself and, and stuff like that. So it um, it very quickly became clear also that the, the clicker just didn't carry enough um, loudness to to reach the animals in certain circumstances. I mean, we just we just had to back it up over and over again with the verbal bridge, even though they learned on the clicker. Hmm. Um, so we and then I did test a, a little bit of trained behavior where we trained certain behaviors only with the clicker and certain behaviors only with the verbal bridge. Um, now, mind you, I don't use a base. I don't use only a basic verbal bridge. I also have these different differential reinforcement stimuli, right. which you can only get on the verbal. Right. But you would be surprised to know that the, um, given that that's the case, they learned much faster on the, um, on the verbal because I could give them all this other information. I could tell them not just great, but wow. And I could tell it to them right then at the moment that it occurred. Yeah. Wow. Very good. I, you know, like uh, you mentioned jackpot and clicker and um, to me, there is always a, an issue with, you know, I mean, exactly like how the verbal and the, the levels, like if you, the moment you, you make the same sound for average behavior and then you want to give a jackpot and you have the same sound and now it's a jackpot in in some ways the, the at least the dog is like how come this time is this and this time is this and it's the same sound and i i feel that when when you have verbal jackpot you're naturally signaling, marking in a very different voice that it announces that this is a big deal to where uh, uh, the click is so dry at the moment and it's like, okay, I'm probably going to get a cookie and all of a sudden I get a lot of cookies. And now I, I feel dogs are like, okay, it, it's almost like a, they get confused, like what am I going to get and why? It's not, you know, even though we're thinking, well, we're jackpotting, therefore you're gonna come to the conclusion, the right conclusion. But the, the announcement stays the same for an average reward yeah. and a big reward, yeah. and that's not easy. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like it somehow clouds the, the point a little bit. Right. Um, yeah. Because when you being, think of Las Vegas, same. you know, like you, <laughs> yes, you get the little coins, but then when it's the jackpot, the whole hotel, the whole casino just yeah. goes nuts, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and well, uh, I agree. I think the clicker, if, if anything, it has to have this option, <laughs> like, a, like on the other side, maybe you have a jackpot click, you know, something. But why not just use your voice? You have it. Right. You didn't have to buy it. You don't right. have to get it in your hand. Now you have two hands. You didn't have it. And you're, so one of the things people say is, oh, the animals won't understand because people's voices are different. I had a school of people that had 200 people come through 
worked with our animals. We, they let, you know, they worked with and developed relationships and trained our fleet of animals, which might've been, you know, somewhere between five and 10 animals at a time. And we never had this problem. We never had the problem that because people's voices were different, the animals couldn't understand. Much as you understand a different person, whether they're speaking with an accent or whether, you know, I mean, it's, animals are adapted to um, pick out meaningful information. They're looking for that. Right. They wanna know where where things pay more. When That's they want to know, they, they, yeah, some hundred percent. And I'm very glad to hear that, uh, like like your your take on, on clicker, because uh, again, I, I'm not against it, but it's, there is sometimes just like, a, um, you know, it becomes a, a, a statement. I, I am using science to train and therefore I'm holding a clicker. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> it's like well that's a very um what is that it's like a signaling uh, yeah it really is yeah a, it really a kind is. of like uh, it's about the wrong reason of course it's science either way and based on the exact same principle you condition a voice bridge exactly the same now one thing that people can do wrong is that they'll use many different you know like one moment they're saying good boy and the next moment they're saying only good and the next moment they're saying correct uh fantastic or whatever so that is that is where the blurred line can be um less precise that you know the value of the clicker is that it it is um, an identical reproducible sound that helps in the conditioning process and I think it might also be important to realize there's a difference between the moment where you're um, charging up the clicker and getting or the or the bridge, because I'd really rather talk about it as a bridge or a reward marker, if you prefer. And and the the clicker has somehow become the word for bridge stimuli. But I want to push back on that because I think that's like just a brand. It's like saying Hoover when you mean vacuum cleaner Correct. or something. It, it's not or English to mean language. There's lots of languages. All languages aren't represented by English and there's lots of bridges and they're not all represented by clicking. So while it's a it's a powerful and um, valuable tool that's been spread and it, it is based on science, the science that it's based on is just associating a pure tone with an outcome. It's not, there's nothing magic about the clicker right. itself. It's not like the one noise that unites all the animal kingdom. It's just a noise that um, that works. Yeah, there are, there are a few studies, like I, I've been lately working with uh, uh, one of the canine science labs with uh, um, Dr. Clyde Wynn and, and Anne-Marie Johnson. They did a, they did a study on clicker. And, and yeah, I mean, the, found, the finding was exactly that they did not find any difference between, uh, and, and in fact, it almost uh, is like a, like pulling back a little bit with the clicker than, than accelerating the, the process. Um, I don't my know. Experience. And then I think the, all, I think if someone really did a fair study, that's what you'd see. Although it might depend on species, it might depend on individuals. A lot of times animals are afraid of the noise of the clicker at first. True. I mean, I work yeah, with exotics, true. but. Yeah, very true. And, and it's so hard, as you said, it's so hard to make a study, any study, when you don't have the rapport with the animal. And, and I mean, I'm sure with any animal that you, you spend enough time, you can, and this is what I, when I teach at my school, like, I'm like, okay, yeah, we can, we can teach the basic communication. We can have a, a keep going signal. We can have a release signal and so on and so on. But eventually this is like your basic. This is like, hello, my name is Ivan and I can say this in a bunch of languages. But from there on, I can call my dog like this. I can call my dog like this. I can, I mean, in hundred ways and my dog will come every single time because now we are in tuned and we're paying attention and we're speaking above the basic language of signals you know 
I know. Yes. I mean, that's what you were hoping for, right? That's, I think most animal trainers, that's what they're looking to develop is such a complexity of, um, of all of the, I mean, it's going to be that they will, the animal will have seen the physical cues that the person is right. using associated with the early conditioned information. And they're just layering in new SDs and, and um, they'll see, like, I mean, I keep going yes. back to Clever yeah. Hans, but they'll understand the nuanced um, elements that, that are associated with that antecedent arrangement that leads towards that, um, I mean, I'm going back to the science, but while in complete agreement with you, it's not that it's magic. What happens is over time, um, the, the communication richness, because exactly. your whole body is what the animal is paying attention to. Exactly. Um, becomes, and, and uh, yeah, becomes a component of your, of your communication. And that makes it so much more interesting. Be, exactly. I, I was just going to say I, way more interesting. And, and a lot of times dog trainers are afraid to, to open that door and, and stay within. Okay. No, I have to be just like with the clicker, very mechanical. Okay, I have to mark this. I have to release now, I, and and the the like you're not expressing your feeling of the interaction. It's just lost, and then you're focusing on the behavior only, and then of course ultimately you're paying the price for for not having that other level of interaction. Um, yeah, I agree. You, you lose some of the, um, there's something about this that's a little bit like cooking, you know, it's like you've stuck to a recipe, but yes. you have no um, finesse with your, uh, all the different ingredients and, and yeah. flavor profiles and all that, you know. It's it, like it, painting by numbers, actually, yeah. right, with this little. Yeah, you can get somewhere, but it's just not quite as magical if you don't have, you um, Plus, I think if the person is working really hard to control themselves and keep their kind of everything boxed up, um, the animal is not prepared for the you know anyone else for one thing who isn't going to necessarily be quite so sterile, and um, the regimented experience uh, I think doesn't uh, properly prepare the animal for life. Like there's something where they're um, they almost become institutionalized in those kinds of right. two. It, it, you see this in animals that have, have lived it because I'm in a research environment. You see animals that have lived in research protocols for very long periods of time, having you know problems with sort of stereotypies or with um, with uh, changes, um, small changes like size of yes, food reward yes. or something like that, kind of throws them off because they were. They never got smoothed out in their early development periods, learning about, you know, maybe the broader experience of life, which involves lots of noise and lots of movements and lots of sounds and, you know, just just more, um, especially if I would think for dogs, it's very important. Hmm. You know, they're out there with people. So when you do like uh, like back to sea lions or, or you can do yeah, I mean, I, I'm interested in, in other animals that you've done, but is it primarily food reward that you would use with, with the exotic animals? Like, or would play have any role? Like for me, I'm very, I'm like huge proponent on play interactions because this is just what I can do with dogs and there is a lot of value in that. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you can go that in that kind of deep play to where you can have a sea lion really want to play with you to where you can have some oh, rules absolutely and you really can. yeah i think you can with almost any animal um so my basic position on this is you you have to start with whatever you've got which in the case of dogs is a lot so you you're preloaded right you have a lot more reinforcers at your disposal but the idea of of limiting yourself to um to a single category of consumable reinforcer seems absurd to me um or it's not absurd that's maybe a flippant way of putting it but i think it's um it's a limitation it's restricted uh, it's like painting yeah. with one color so 
what you're doing, what you would be doing is sure, you may have to start there with a lot of exotic animals. You probably have to start there. That's all you have. And in fact, you're probably pretty offensive to them when they first hmm. meet you because they you, people have been handling them or whatever. That may even be true of horses. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, and that can be true also of dogs, right? Abused dogs For in sure. particular. So you start with what you have, but right away, you'd be training other conditioned reinforcers. This is why I made that um, that distinction earlier. So we would be conditioning them to enjoy petting, to enjoy praise, and, and then to enjoy object manipulation, and then from there to enjoy play with us with that object. Um, and those things then take on a life of their own. The more comfortable the animal is, the more they kind of come out of the box and be interested in play on their own. And then you can engage with that. So actually in the Mindful Partners book, I talk about, you know, I worked with one of these animals out in the ocean and she was, it, it, in research it's often like a hurry up and wait kind of situation. So she'd be sitting in the ocean, free swimming around and it, it, we were waiting on something, you know, like the other researchers or whatever. And so she'd get bored and she'd go down to the seafloor and find, um, we, we happened to be over top of um, a sand dollar mm. uh, communities. And she would find these little Frisbee shaped sand dollars and bring them up to see if she could get the button going to, can we just start this please? Cause wow. I'm, you know, I'm bored here. And, um, and so we would play Frisbee with sand dollars. We would play Frisbee um, type games, retrieval type games with our sea lions all the time. I do think that's part of their, um, their link back to dogs, mm -hmm. but I've had this with horses. I've had this with all kinds of other animals. Dolphins are really playful too. Some animals naturally really get into massage, like like being petted. Um, you can get that going with horses quite a lot. I found loofahs. I found smells. Like if you're working with big cats, smells can be really reinforcing for them. Um, the sky's the limit. And in the end, the biggest reinforcer, and this gets back to the earlier part of our conversation, I'm hoping to develop myself as the biggest reinforcer, which means whatever happens between me and them is enjoyable because it involves like this deep friendship, just like it is with your friends. You know, it's like, wow, we get to be together. I get to work. I get to right. learn. Right. That becomes some of the strongest reinforcers you have. And that has a kind of play element to it. You know, I mean, work and play are, are linked together, right? Play is about learning life skills um that help you forage typically you know you 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 know the the dog training world is quite divided right of, of you have the purely positive trainers you have trainers that use aversives you have and any gray in between a lot of times <clears throat> uh when when there is a discussion or debate it will be brought up that well if you can teach a lion or an elephant to, to draw blood from, then without using any form of aversive, then you really shouldn't be resorting to train a dog ever with using an aversive. It's, a, it's a, one of these arguments that comes up very often in I, I find it very misleading because... Um, <laughs> yeah, they're not inside with the it, lion and the, and the right. uh, elephant. Like we, we, we're in a two separate worlds and asking for very different things. And there is not much that's competing with you. And, but I, I just kind of want to hear because I know you're a master of, of both. So it would be very interesting to hear your thoughts on this. Well, my first thought is I have a lot of sympathy, empathy for people grappling with this problem. And I think that the um, the heart of the discussion is about everybody on both sides of this wants to be kind and wants to do well with their animals. And what, what fails is, is a sense that um, one side – 
cares more than the other about that. I don't believe that for a second. I don't believe that for a second. Um, I think depending on what your training goals are, uh, well, I guess another thing I would say is I've never seen a program that actually didn't use uh, all the quadrants. I, I, I think it's impossible. Um, so for example, in the dog training world, um, are these people who are purely positive reinforcement trainers, quote unquote, are they using leashes? Because if right. they are, game over. A leash has it, one purpose. What happens when the animal gets to the end of the leash? Control. There is pressure on their body. <laughs> that pressure, by definition, is negative reinforcement. I mean, I'd call it manipulation-based negative reinforcement if I wanted to categorize it perfectly. And I understand it's not exactly what you're talking about, but it is. Because right. this is the thing of these terms is that actually nobody's not using both. They're, they're, w the idea would be to try to use the minimal possible aversive that's necessary relative to whatever it is that is um, the you know, a, a wholesome and good outcome for both parties. And, um, you know, because I'm a relationship based person, I am trying to focus on positives. And I have no doubt that you are too. Oh, yeah. But there are some things where you you have to keep the animal for the animal's sake or for the person's sake. I mean, I don't know a lot about um, the, uh, the world that you're in, but I do know, you know, you train dogs that attack people right? Uh, right. That, that under certain circumstances have to do that. And that has to turn on and off at exactly the right time or very serious problems will, will come up. Um, and that level of, of training um, is very different than the average uh, dog walker. So right. there is, there is a sophistication associated with that. Um even the people with the, uh, you know, the a lion or uh, an elephant collecting blood, which it's true, is uh, the actual blood collection side of things would always be done with positive reinforcement. But those people don't go inside. They're Correct. working through a fence. Um, they have no uh, risk to them. And is it ever the case that they use negative reinforcement to move those animals from one place to the next? Mm. Mm. I'm going to guess probably so, or it probably has happened. Um, or if not that, they might use, for example, anesthesia. Um, you know, when they have to do some kind of major procedure with the animal, they may use a dart to knock them down. Right. Um, it's one of these weird places where what category is that? But that's pretty aggressive. It's pretty aversive. Um, or they'll put animals, they'll train the animals to go into crushes, you know, restraint devices. And they'll have them trained for voluntary restraint, but restraint is still that pretty. Is still, that um, is still, that is trained. Yeah, it's still, it's still aversive. And, I, you know, you start to get into these really gray areas where I think what's laudable and what's good is that people are trying to be as positive as they possibly can and realize that there is a lot that can be accomplished that way. I actually think a lot of the positive reinforcement dog trainers don't train their dogs to give voluntary blood samples. How do they get the blood sample on the dog? They grab the dog and hold the dog and hold the dog's neck and tell it it's a good dog and somebody's, you know, surprise taking, them. Taking, <clears throat> yeah. That is that is not positive reinforcement. Yeah, it's uh yeah, there is now um the whole um the fear free clinics and I mean we we're getting somewhere and it's not a bad thing for sure it's not a bad thing but no matter how much we talk like you're familiar with the fear free movement right with the dogs and the cats and just the veterinary clinics and and um I think it's also you know I mean it's a good marketing it, it definitely like if if I'm bringing a dog and I have a choice well there is a fear for the clinic and there is a regular clinic which one do you go to most likely we go to the fear free but sometimes I think well 
no matter how many cookies you're going to give to a dog, there will be a, a dog that is just not social. There will be a dog that is way more shy than another dog. And there's pretty much nothing you can do when you take that dog to a vet clinic for that dog to convince him to feel comfortable just because their genetics are not that strong. And they just trust you. And after one, I don't know, some, some kind of surgery or something goes, you know, like there is a, a negative experience in the clinic, which is not that uncommon because some, some procedure had to be done, being, being whatever. And then, then there is a setback. And just to, to, to have this, well, we're gonna, you, your dog's not going to be afraid when he goes to the clinic. And, and say that as a, just like an overall statement for every dog is a, nothing but uh, uh, it's actually misleading because you, you know, you will have dogs that will go, the, the, the most dogs that will search to go to a fear-free clinic will be the dogs that are either very unsure, very shy, very just uh, concerned about the environment or any other people. And going one time to the clinic, it's not going to help to, to convince that dog to feel better, no matter how many cookies you're going to give it. Most likely, they wouldn't, would, that kind of dog wouldn't even want to do anything with treats at this point. It, it, it's very interesting how we, we always put into an extreme something and and like the it's very hard it doesn't like what, what I'm saying is it with one or two visits you cannot convince a dog not to be afraid especially a weaker temperament dog they will be afraid and sometimes it just they have to the, the veterinarian has to do what they have to do um, I've been to a vet clinic like this where it's like, okay, yeah, we give them treats, we do this. And then they put the leash and then take the dog inside. Now, when the dog comes out and it's running to come and just clinches on you, you know the experience wasn't that great. But you cannot blame the veterinarians for being great or not. They have to ultimately take care of the health, whatever the urgency is that they need to do. Um, but there is this marketing of we, we can do it better without actually saying that it cannot work better for every dog. Dogs that are confident, they can go in and they can you know, like, I, I would love to take my dog to this kind of clinic because I know they will be friendly and, and my dog will respond fine. But that's not every dog. And, and there is a little bit of, I wouldn't even say that it's dishonesty. It's just something that we don't talk about, about these specific dogs that I'm saying that they're still going to, if they're aggressive, they don't have to be sedated or they have to be muzzled and there's going to be a process that will not be that. I think it's similar with, with different, you know, just like how you said, well, if, if you have a leash on the dog, you, you're controlling it. And, and at some point the dog gets controlled because the dog wants to do this and you will restrict it from doing it. And so, um, and, and there will be different levels of that. Like if you say, um, you, like I, I know a lot of trainers and I, I'm not sure like when you train, especially at the exotic animals or all the animals that you train, do you, like, like is it, do you train by trial and error? Do you tell the dog or the sea lion 
they are on the wrong path? Do you say no or something to disapprove of an action? Or do you just focus on the, the good side of things? Um, first, I, if, boy, this is, uh, there's a lot in here. I know, so I just I'm went too far. Pick it apart. <laughs> I'm going to pick it apart because there are some things that you said that um, that are very important to me. So the, the fear-free veterinary work, regardless of the term, and I agree with you that, you know, there's marketing, which I'm not good at personally either, because I think the reason, you know, the thing about behavior is it's very nuanced and it's not, it's like the rest of science. It's not an absolute, you, you don't get some, this isn't a motorcycle. This is a being. Right, 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 um, right. It, it right. has, um, it's shades of gray. Okay. But there, do I think it's important for this movement to be developing so that people don't just, I think the mental health of an animal is more important than the physical health. I'm going to say that radical thing. I think it is more important for us all to feel good because actually you own your, your experience of something is only about how you think about it. It's not actually the rest. So, I care at least on equal measure. I make a big point of this in my current book. I care on equal measure, the emotional health. And a lot of the stuff that we do with animals, I'm talking about non-emergent situations, mm -hmm. is that we have not prepared them for their basic life needs. And their basic life needs is going to a veterinarian. So right from the puppy phase, we should be working in that direction so that we don't get those traumatized animals that are blown out the way you're describing. Yeah. So those clinics are working towards the whole life of the animal, not just that moment through approximations where they're not, where they're thinking about more than just the procedure. They're thinking about preparing the animal in a positive way for all of the future veterinary visits, which by the way, people should do with human beings and children as well. Mm. You know, like the dentist where you go and you get your lollipop, that should be your experience. So I think it has, I mean, one thing I would say is don't make perfection the enemy of the good, you know, just because you can't get it right, you know, where mm -hmm. every dog is perfectly fixed on one trial doesn't mean you shouldn't be moving in that direction. You should be moving in that direction. The marketing side, you know, advertisings and things like that. I'm not going to get into the discussion about whether advertising is, you know, too strong or whatever. That's that's true of everyone's sort of claims. And maybe people like you and I who are used to the nuance of how difficult it is to actually get behavior, probably we undersell a lot of what we can do because we know there. Every, every individual animal is different and it will depend. But I will push back on something you said, which is that I do not think any animal because of genetics cannot be moved towards less fear if you take the approximations that are correct. And this is not just about using counter conditioning, using reinforcement. This is also about systematic desensitization and the analysis of the variables associated with the fear and remembering that there's a lot of reinforcers you have to lessen the aversive environment. The relationship between the owner and the dog is one, how quiet the environment is one, the demeanor of the, the uh, veterinarian is one, like whether they go in and grab or whether they spend some time you know, lowering their posture. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that, that that are very subtle about how you can break down the experience and take it slower so you don't get over the threshold of the animal. And the question is, to what extent is this an emergency or are you building towards a future thing? You know, like if it's right. just a routine procedure, like a checkup or um, maybe it's even a vaccination, but they don't necessarily need to get that vaccination right now. Maybe you, you put in some trials, do it every day for a week or something like that before you get to the point, do some work at home. You know, those clinics can also work with the owner to, to have dummy needles that they, that they work with at home. 
this is the bread and butter of what I do. My my a lot of my trainers are running these kinds of clinics. So, and, but that would you know, go to education of of I mean, as you point out, there is a lot of homework that needs to be done, and and a, a lot of the. I, I guess that that is where a problem is because when when that homework is not emphasized on and you go to a fear fit clinic or you go to a normal clinic and a procedure is done there is a, a, a um, you know you a dog that is shy you will rush the dog there is just no no time and if it's a again like if it's a vaccination problem then hopefully the vet says well let's do this take time come again come again a lot of people will do that some veterinarians will actually and again i i i cannot speak for everybody because obviously there is dif different different clinics with different intentions but the the places that i have been to the fear free is is a like i i don't i don't think they have even done much work to to understand what it is it's like okay the dog is coming there is a bag of treats on the counter let's give him some treats if he's not taking it that's fine if he's taking it that's okay and then we're going in and we're doing procedure and and then the dog comes out and at that point everything is done and nobody pays attention how the dog feels at that moment. Um, it doesn't um, sound like a really, um, that, that they have a psychology uh, background right. here. But I guess that's what I'm saying, like a lot of, yeah, like a, there, there is, I think it's becoming popular, trendy, and not everybody has gone through through education how to do a fear free and it's like okay we we call the clinic fear free but um, um, maybe maybe it's just a new thing still and and it's going it, it, it will get better um, yeah yeah. One would hope that they'd have, so I guess if there are listeners who are thinking about this, it, it sounds like it's a buyer beware thing, just like mm -hmm. every other type of service out there. People mm -hmm. advertise themselves, whether or not that's true, that depends. And, and I think if it's a really legitimate clinic, like some of the clinics that my students work in, and this would be your students too, I mean, this is a great opening industry that that has a lot of potential the idea of veterinary work and behavior work getting together started in the um the zoo and aquarium yeah. industry and should expand into the domestic industry it is yeah. really amazing if you develop this partnership of the whole welfare of the animal but it does mean the qualified trainers have to be involved in the entire plan of how the clinic works and it has to be a component of their um, their big picture. Uh, so that would that would have a lot of levels to it. It would have it would have the uh, analysis of the rooms and and a whole plan of training for particular animals that have been blown out, um, and then uh, different strategies according to emergency. But there's even ways of right. administering um, anesthesia that is more mild versus less uh, right. you know like we we would have an emergency protocol where animals would get into a cage and we would do what's called a, a chamber induction on them where you infuse the cage mm -hmm. the cage is masked and you infuse the cage with anesthesia so that nobody's grabbing them mm -hmm. um, so they don't experience the panic of being held down um, now, in either case, they're being anesthetized, but in one case, they're being kind of 
their last memories before they fall asleep or somebody's like holding them down and it's pretty terrifying. And there is training though. I mean, they have to be trained, right? Yeah. People like the people you're training, when they have this skill set, they can go in and start working in these veterinary clinics as the behavioral consultant and really get in there and make a difference. I think that's the direction of the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the word fear free is a little misna misnomer because, well, I'm a Buddhist and we say um, that, you know, that fear, <laughs> fear is one of the basic you, things you you're need. trying to guarantee. You, you, you know, need. Because it's, it's, it's also necessary. So the idea of having a completely fear free life, this is an illusion. And if someone's trying to sell that to you, I've got a bridge for you that I, I'd like to sell you for, for certain, you know, that old, now, that old joke. I've got a bridge right, in Brooklyn right. I'd like to sell you or something like that. Right, but, right. Okay, so there's no such thing as truly being fear-free, but you can have degrees of it where you keep the levels down to um, what we want is not to traumatize the animals so that we're trying to to um, work, work on these animals that have had such extreme experiences that uh, that they're just completely sensitized. That's what we want to do. We want to keep, we, you know, this psychologically, we would right. say sensitization minimal <laughs> clinics or something like that. <laughs> but I don't think that will sell as well as fear of free. So, um, so, you know, you just, I think you have to take it with a grain of grain of salt. And there was something else you asked me, and I, I can't remember because I was so interested in the, yeah. in the story of, of, um, yeah, this is a lot of my work, and it's a lot of what my second book is about, actually. So that's good. We're getting, we're getting there. I mean, reducing fear. I, I guess my point is, we're, it's it, it definitely is a work in progress. It's not a, you know, um, it, not not every clinic that claims it. Um, yeah, but when you said that you were working with like fearful animals and and you like you have success what tell tell me a little bit more about this because that's definitely um, of interest like what kind of approaches what do you approach well, I imagine you know a lot sure, about it as sure. well since it's a big part of the industry isn't it but sure sure my my and I'd be interested what your answer is First of all, I would not give up on any animal, although I do agree that um, some animals will have had sensitizing experiences. I think it's more about their mm -hmm. sensitization than it is about their breed or their genetics. Mm -hmm. Although I agree with you that by, by, uh, by birth, some animals will be more um, inherently, either because of their species or because of their breed, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. will be more inherently um, neophobic, um, mm -hmm. to use the term, M more, uh, more afraid of new experience. Um, but I think that's always m mobile. We can always change it. Neuroplasticity is true throughout your life, throughout their life. So how big the gully is in terms of the traumatic experience and how we have to work with it depends. But the, the, so there's two sides of this. One is if the animal has already been blown out, been sensitized. And the other is how can we stop, how can we get enough information into the public and into people to understand how to prevent this from happening in the first place? So the, the, there's two sides. There's like, in your world, it might be puppy training and, and then right. what to do with the, um, with the fear biting dog or the, you know, the already, the already the uh, sensitized animal. And, and, um, you know, I work a lot on trying to get people to understand that, th that in the end, it's so much better to prevent the problem from setting up than it is to try to fix it once you've got it. Because sensitization is a horrible problem when, when animals have these kinds of fear biting habits or runaway habits um you know th there's it's a lot harder to um break that down than it would yeah, have yeah, been to yeah. just be careful about the exposure in the first place so that is 
you know, that's a background that I want to make a big yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Better not to blow the animal out and do what is necessary slowly. The but in either case, it it it, it does involve the same bag of tricks: counter conditioning, using positive, um, attractive uh, elements to reduce the stimulus uh, value of a negative experience. Um, and then the second part is the big one, which is systematic desensitization analysis. Understanding what variables associated with a novel st stimulation will cause fear and how to reduce that. Um, and breaking the, the stimulus experience into small bits. So for example, I've worked with, you know, dozens and dozens of exotic animals doing incredibly painful, oh. scary yeah. procedures, like voluntary tooth removals on carnivores that are standing there with their mouths open, getting 19 injections around a tooth, oh. and then having yeah. the tooth surgically cut out of their mouth, no leash, nothing on the animal holding it there. So that's the level that you can get to. And if I can do that with an exotic animal, you can definitely do it with a dog. But what I had to do was I had to um, approach that very slowly and systematically. So what are some of the elements that make a veterinary procedure scary? There's the whole setting scene, the smell in the environment. So I'm, I'm trying to think dog-like here. So you've got all the other dog smells and cat smells, and you've got the smell of, um, you know, sure. alcohol and all the things. Alcohol, animal glands, I mean, everything. So you can start with this, breaking those bits down um, and thinking about them. Um, th there's also the, um, the experience of being grabbed, held, forced, um, poked and prodded. There's the physical sensation of like needles and that kind of stuff. Um, there's the person in the white coat with its, uh, with the uh, stethoscope. Um, so there's all that visual. So it's all the antecedents basically and manipulating the antecedents to a level that uh, are not signaling a panic. Yeah, or even reversing it. So we have all of our veterinarians come bearing gifts. So this, I mean, you know, in your case, it would be cookie, but it's not just right. cookie. It's also get down on the floor. It's also wait for the dog to approach you. It's also using a soft voice. It's also not grabbing them right away. Um, it's also uh, the, the, um, the room that they experience in you know, uh, the posture that the dog is in, are they in a place where they feel confident? Are they in a place where they feel, you know, subordinated? Um, how much time have they had to acclimate to the room? And uh, so, so one of the extremes might be like, um, we used to say, oh, the yummy, yummy fireworks. Mm -hmm. Fireworks mm -hmm. very often scare animals, no, mm -hmm. no matter what kind of animal, right? And um, what we did was we conditioned the fireworks to be a, a jackpot bridge stimulus. And we would start with, we started with the sound on recorder. So we could modulate, we could control the stimulus strength. So stimulus strength is like how big the stimulus is. And you've got volume, movement, Duration is very related big. to the animal. I list out all these things. Duration of exposure is a really important Duration's one. Duration is very big. Yeah, how long? So, so it's very important when you're starting with the variables to um, to break them down, but yeah. not make the animal have to endure them for very prolonged periods of time. Just small, not not, not and feeling away, trapped in you know, it, so that you don't get that adrenalized reaction to it. Not um, not, the, not feeling trapped in it. Yeah. That's it. So, um, so you take all of these elements and you, like number number of people, number of moving things around. For some animals, it'll be colors. And you start breaking it down, and you do the simple ones first. You know, you just start wearing around stethoscopes and white coats and going for walks. You start uh, putting some alcohol right. on your right. jacket each day before you put out the food. 
you know, you start making, right. you, you start right. power conditioning right. all those cues so that they're actually the opposite of what they seem to indicate. You take walks to the vet clinic and there's a jackpot there and then you get to go play Frisbee. You but know, say go this to the is where the, the get a free Frisbee play or whatever is your this story. This is what, where really um, and it's then, about. It's not like the, the majority of the work is done by the owner as a homework and, and not so much at the clinic. The clinic is, is the, the next step. But, well, I'm thinking the but, clinic but guides you, the owner to understanding these steps. So it's like <laughs> in, a, in a well-run clinic, um, they should give this kind of a training plan when they go to a puppy shots or something, right? When the first visit or something, that would make sense, yeah. And I'm sure some of them are exactly exactly this way. Um, but you said you have a you you would have success with even with noise sensitivity by by manipulating the environment and and desensitizing and counter conditioning. Uh, so noise sensitivity. Um, the way that I would work with that is, you know, obviously first there is a two pronged approach. One would be at home in a comfortable environment on recorder, um, mm -hmm. you know, where you can control the volume and the distance. So another thing I haven't mentioned, but distance is huge in, in right. fear-based reactions. In so, every and reaction, then, space, space and duration is yeah. fundamental, right? Right, exactly. So the further away than th this occurs, as long as you can, um, as long as you can process it, the better it is. And the other thing to to consider is also companionship, especially for dogs. Like if you have another dog that it, you know, if you've got in in horses, we use like pace horse, race horse, because race horses tend to be very um, high energy, you know, excitable animals, and they put like a you know, a, a mare that is bomb proof in there. So if you have a bomb proof animal to be with the, with the, um, the frightened animal, this can help as well. Um, so there's a lot of reinforcers at your disposal It is not just food, right? But oh, so, so that would be uh, one thing, but also the, um, yeah, the, the volume and the duration, just a little bit on recorder and then, um, uh, some reinforcement, whatever works for that animal. Um, a lot of encouragement, I would think, from the owner. And then, you know, short duration, many trials at home. And then try to set up an appointment at the clinic that is either um, very beginning of the day or, or very end of the day, quiet time. Just, you know, right. if, you, if you've got a veterinarian that does not care about this, get a different veterinarian. Find a veterinarian you can work with who is respecting the needs of the dog, um, at least somewhat, and and work with them on um, when is the quiet times? How can we, you know, how can we set this right. up for the success of the dog? Oh yeah, yeah also no, for sure. The there is, and, will come but out again, it's like with dog right. training, you have dog trainers and different kind of dog trainers, and um, yeah. It's it's a it's a very interesting one. Um, the I, I'm where where I'm thinking is about the playing the the tapes for the sounds and stuff. I used to do that because I I breed like I've been breeding Malinois for for like long long time. And when the first those cassette players came, I don't know it was like early 90s or late 80s and I was like oh yeah I'm gonna play this to my dogs and um, I, I never found that they really I, I, I think the dogs never connected the, the sound that plays from the the music box to the any lightning or any other sound and and even if they get desensitized to some level, anytime a sudden loud noise comes, the, the reaction that uh, a lot of dogs will have, it, they, it, it almost, 
in my experience, has been unavoidable. Um, well, that's true because there is a hardwired reflex. So there's what's called the novelty effect that none of right. us can avoid, no matter what, if you get startled. But I'm jump. going further with that uh, because the, we, we all can get startled, but then it's the recovery goes quickly to where um, certain dogs or animals will, that they cannot function. I wouldn't say they are shut down because they're, but they are definitely in a flight kind of mode. And, and really the best thing to do is to give them space and take them out instead of trying to, to do anything else at that point. And I have not found uh, um, any solution to this um, to overcome that kind of genetic uh, predisposition to, and I think it's a genetic predisposition because like, um, I know I've worked, like when I worked at guide dogs in San Rafael. I lived in, in California, in all over the Bay Area in the 90s. And um, the, the one thing that we'll do is when the breeding program, the puppies get tested, and then they will come at 15, 14 months old for training. And the very first thing will be a gunshot on a, on a distance, and some dogs will just not be able to recover. Some dogs will get started, some dogs will not. And of course, they will be in a group. We will have, let's say, 20 dogs. And you have that one that really says, okay, I need to get out, even though everybody else around them feels comfortable. Um, and the only way that I have found to, to try to make a dog overcome that kind of sensitivity would be when they, it can be, they have to override it with something and that something typically has to be some action. Um, and if, if there is no action and there is no, like I can say, okay, there is a loud noise and that can trigger it to go active into doing something as a signal. And this can work, uh, and it has worked for me and, and for many trainers. But at the same time, if we present the noise, even the dog that's already learned that that signals action, now there is nothing we don't, we don't start to play or we don't start protection work or anything. And we do that a few times. And now the dog starts to stress just as, as it did before because, uh, um, you know, it, it doesn't lead to, to it, it becomes, ex, it's an extinction now. The, the, it doesn't signal that kind of reinforcement. There is nothing to override the fear with. And I, I cannot find uh, a solution that can really work with certain genetic problems. Like I don't, um, and I, even, even like with little puppies, I, I feel that sometimes we do the wrong thing by, you know, playing this kind of tapes and, and trying or, or exposing them to so many different environmental stimuli that if a puppy is genetically weaker, we may be actually, instead of helping them, we may be poking at it and make amplifying the problems. And at that young age, we cannot see it. And we're watching all of them as a package, eight or nine of them, right? And thinking, okay, well, everybody's happy, but uh, um, I don't know, sometimes I think that um, when we have that good intention to, to make the dog more resilient and we add stimuli, but we are not really yet understanding who that little puppy is as an individual, we may be uh, uh, making the whatever is underneath, making it 
uh, come out stronger than, than by, by actually thinking that we're helping. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of like what my mom was worried about with my immune system, only on a behavioral right. level. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And that's true. Um, so a, a few things that I pulled out of your story is, um, first of all, if you're trying to pay attention to nine individuals at once, you're going to be missing a lot of the subtle data that you need to hear because you need to pick up on the small signals. You know, the, the point, the way that desensitization works is you take a baseline of how the animal is behaving comfortably. And then you very slowly introduce the stimulus below threshold. Right. So the full on gunshot is not the place to start. What is there that's between a gunshot, even at a distance, and, um, you know, maybe you don't like the recorder, but something something that can be like that, but is less. Right, and, right. And, and also where you're watching each individual animal, you know, it's one thing to take an animal in a pair or something like that. You say, you have a very advanced dog, you know, this dog doesn't respond to the gunshot. So you know that animal is a good partner to your puppy that is going through this. So you can ignore the the dog, not ignore, but you can you can take for granted the dog who is bomb proof, and they can be there as a reward and as right. a, as a you know a calm space for the animal who may or may not have a reactive tendency that you don't know at birth. Um, but you still, and this is still about prevention before um, training it out, because you're right. If you overexpose someone early on, you will get sensitization and you need to know if you've overexposed them. But the, but the, the, the key is then to, is to do it so gently that you find out when you're starting to stimulate them and it's not correct. It's not just to throw them into a circumstance. So right. I mean, that's how we would do it with our animals is that we would assume by default, they would have a reaction. We would take the, we would take the conservative view that they, that the worst case scenario is they're going to have the reaction and we're going to treat it as though they're going to have that reaction. And we're going to train right through that by very, very carefully taking small approximations. Um, and we're going to watch their eyes, their tension level, their breathing, right. their willingness to engage with play. And I'll tell you something else. I'm big about communication. So I usually warn my animals. This is a weird thing, but I usually uh, start telling them. So in my earlier phases, in the lesser version of the gunshot, whatever it's going to be. So maybe it's just, maybe it's a, um, a, a, a popping noise that isn't like a gun, but it is similar to sure, a gun. Sure. Okay. A, um, a lesser noise. Maybe it's somebody in the distance going pop or something like that. A and bubble, so it's something uh, I can control. Whatever. It, it And I'm going to take it to its smallest point. Maybe at first they're going to go pop and then they're going to go pop, you know, and then whatever. So I'm going to, I'm going to start teaching them this incident is going to happen. And I'm going to set that up with a cue. I'm going to like, I completely agree with you, by the way, the animal should have something to do. Something to do that you're reinforcing. So sitting or, you know, whatever you think is the right thing for them to be doing. Stationing in some way, standing on a stand. Those are classic things. And they, they're they concentrated on doing that. And then you inform them, this thing is going to happen. Something's about to happen. I want you to look over here. Right. Pay attention over here. It's going to happen. It happens. Yeah. And you go, as it's happening, you go, wow, that was the best of that, you must have yeah. made that happen. You pay the animal for it before they even have a chance to spend too much time processing. Maybe you repeat that three times, leave it alone, come back another day, do the same thing, increase the stimulus strength very carefully. Now the dog starts to realize through the learning process, okay, he's pointing to something, something's about to happen, there it is. Okay, look at me, I'm so proud, I'm so big, I'm so good. And you build up a resilience around the fact that they can trust you. I mean, the suddenness of something is one of its biggest problems. So right. that is part of its stimulus strength, the suddenness. And, the, and also, God forbid, it happens behind the animal or over their head. I mean, those are also really bad 
So controlling all of those variables in a very, very careful way, in a very respectful way that helps set the animal up for success. That's how, that's how you can, I think you could prevent any animal from getting sensitized if you did this. Now, if you're trying to do it on eight animals at once, unless you've got eight yeah. trainers watching those eight no, animals. What I, what the, the reason I'm mentioning eight or whatever is because um, typically this starts that kind of desensitization begins much, much sooner with the idea that the, the sooner, I mean, I mean, as soon as, you know, the, the, the puppies are not even hearing yet, they're just feeling vibration. So when you start doing this to that early age, you, you're certainly having a together but you cannot recognize, they don't give you that much signs of what's happening yet. So, so where I was going with this is like, when you go that early, thinking that you will prevent something from happening, so let's say seven of the puppies are totally cool, but there is that one that has that predisposition to sound, and at that early age, if we try to desensitize, we have nothing to go, yes, we don't have anything to, to judge, are we doing too much, are we doing enough, are we, should we stop or not? Because there is not that much that that little thing can tell you, but they definitely can experience it. Right, but they can definitely experience it, and, and if, and this is where I, I am uh, reluctant to do that kind of stuff with, with little puppies. If the puppy is already, yeah, whatever, I mean, it's walking, it's eating solid food, it's, it's definitely all senses are fine. And then we recognize that there is a problem, then I am definitely gonna try to help and do the things you're saying, but, um, I, I, I would at least wait until that moment. I wouldn't assume that if I do this as a prevention to very little puppies, that's gonna help me. I think that's where I'm saying that it will, the puppies that have problems, we are really playing with fire there and may, may make it worse. I, I think that follows the same principle that I'm suggesting, which is the most important thing is preventing sensitization. So sensitization is an increased response to the stimulus associated with learned exposure. Right. That's what we don't want. That's what you're saying happens to some. And I totally agree with you. And it's and that sensitization occurs anytime you experience a stimulus at a stimulus strength that is above your felt potential. And that is individual specific. Right. It's individual and life history specific. So, um, and you can't know what that is. So, so it's very important to watch, walk in gently or, or be very cautious. I'm extremely cautious about exposing animals to stimulus prematurely. Um, maybe one of the more right. cautious people as far as that goes, because I would rather take many small steps and take a little bit longer than run the risk of running into sensitization. Sensitization can be a 20 or 20 to one or a 200 to one more trials than if I did it in a nice stepwise approximation when the animal was ready for it. I don't train my baby sea lions for blood sampling. Right. I train them to do that once I have developed a solid understanding of them and they have a solid understanding of their environment and they have all kinds of yep. behaviors they know how to do and all sorts of uh, trust that is associated with it. And if I was to have to do blood sampling, so what I do train them to do is I do train them to get into cages very, very early in their life. And I use that backup 
um, method of chamber induction. If I had an emergency procedure I needed to run, I infuse the chamber with anesthesia. They never experience any restraint. They never experience any trauma. And we do it that way. And that's how I would do it. Um, with right. a dog, it's easier because they don't mind being handled. You know, a sea lion, you can't even touch it. To teach a sea lion to touch it takes weeks. You know, you, you start out just waving your finger next to it and then, and then you poke it briefly and then you, you know, you vaguely stroke it. I mean, it's a very big deal to, um, just to even touch the animal. So, uh, so it's quite different, but you use what you have at your disposal. The other huh. thing I would say is I get a lot off of, of young animals if you have them in your lap. So you can feel them. You can feel the vibration in their body right. a lot better. Right. I don't know. How do you feel about that? You know, if you put the I mean, yeah. Lap. No, no. That's I, I, I would rather at this point where I am, I, I would rather wait and make sure that they have, I mean, they're not for sure not living in a vacuum bubble. They are experienced normal life but i i i try to avoid this bigger stressors that i know that they can really have some uh um, more more strong uh, reactions to for for a later time to where i can i can judge it very well and decide how to play as we said with space and duration and so on um but um yeah i don't yeah, yeah and in the meantime, you can always do low level stimulus, you know, I mean, just get them used to somebody going pop, 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 right. and not it being a gun. Um, right. The ones that that I always notice that domestic animals get blown out on that people aren't paying attention to hair dryers, vacuum cleaners, clippers. So those are the I mean, gunshots is not usually the one that I'd pick up, but, um, you know, obviously, uh, you can, you can run into that problem, but, um, I, I think it's important for, for them to start seeing the clippers lying around right. and keep the door closed when you're doing your, your hair drying and just be respectful of the potential to sensitize the animal to those stimulus that are naturally going to be the environment that you're ignoring, but that might blow them out. And then you'd have this problem. So those are some things I. Then there is that other one when, when they are um, like, let's say, for example, with, when I was at guide dogs, you know, like you will have the puppies, they will be well there. You will have the volunteers that will be every day having these nice playgrounds with a lot of enrichment and they will play sounds and they will do like they will do a lot of very nice things all the time and very controlled very decent way of exposures but even then when the dogs grow up and come back for training and with test you still have dogs that now not not as puppies but now they have a reaction and and this is sometimes um, another interesting uh, situation where it takes some level of maturity. You need to grow up to finally realize that, oh, this person's looking at me kind of wrong. Or, oh, this is whatever that trash can, it actually can fall down and it can hurt me. Like, you know, so, so the things that as a little, right. So when, when you're really young, you may not see it yet as the danger that it could be. So you're a little bit oblivious to it, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be resilient as you grow up because of the, like things can change, right? Um, well, the, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, and you're completely correct. There's a critical window in everyone's development where, as, an, as a young infant, you're, you're pretty much bomb-proof because you're just a blob right. in some, to a certain extent. And that's where you're getting all your software loaded up about what's normal and what's not normal. And again, you're trying not to do the above-felt potential. Then you get to an adult phase and the adaptation is 
survival, it, you know, real th things out there can kill you. So you're no longer in the protection of your parents and you need to be more um, alert and awake. Yeah. And you do get into these with sea lions. It was like from age two to seven, they'd get really spooky and they would have been fine. Or maybe it's like three to seven or something. It would have seven, been fine for a long period of time. Or, or, or months. Years or months? Years. Years. So well, because they live a lot longer than dogs. So mm -hmm. they'll live into their 30s. Um, oh. So maturity would be eight years old. So where a dog, you'd be thinking, what, two? What would you think? Two to three years maturity? Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Depending on the breed. On that so, so make that seven to eight years with sea lions. Wow. So so you've got this, this window. Um and I completely agree with you. I've seen the exact same thing with dogs. And the, the things I think is, um, so, so I wasn't able to prevent these, uh, when, when the animals hit adulthood and they started to realize, whoa, life really does have some problems. Um, there would be a few things that will have been in play. One is they will have gathered life experience and they will have realized trash cans fall over. Right. And that is true. So that, that, that actually was learned to them, you know, right. or in, or in a case, um, you know, some, some medical procedure had to happen. Um, the second thing is genetic disposition. You know, some animals are just more nervous, like you said. So both those things are true. You can work with the, um, the learning part very judiciously. And I spend a ton of time very carefully growing up during that infant to adulthood period. I, you know, it's not just about a one-off. They went to puppy school and they're done. They need to stay in puppy school until they're adults. Yeah. Um, and that means, you know, a small systematic exposure on a regular basis, very carefully done throughout the entire early development of the animal in order to be sure that that conditioning lasts. It's not a one-off. Um, but of course, there's there's a range of individuals and, and everyone isn't going to be good at the same right. stuff. And and some animals aren't going to be suited for any particular task you're going to apply to them. But that doesn't mean they have to be basket cases either. It's not like you just write them off. I mean, maybe yeah, they wouldn't exactly. be a good competition animal for you, but they're not, you know, they shouldn't just be nothing. Right. Very true. Very true. That, that's uh, the, the genetic and environment nature nurture it's always an interesting one um i i there, there is one that i cannot miss to to ask you about and that's a schedule of reinforcement like what like when you train dogs or sea lions or horses where do you lean more to like is it random continues like what well, where where are you with schedules of reinforcements and and how do you and how do you decide on it uh what a great question i want i want your answer too um i'll give you mine and uh, of course i can i can up. give you mine yeah i can go ahead uh, so i um i tend to like continuous schedule but the reason uh, and again, I mean, depending what we are teaching and what we are maintaining. Um, a lot of the, like, the dogs that we train for competition, they are, you know, some of the behavior are hardly, we are, we are asking a little bit more of their natural, like, let's say if we want the dog to down, they can down or they can, like, really down. But that, that kind of, very flashy response can come very natural for a border collie, but not necessarily for a German Shepherd. And in that situation, I find that continuous reinforcement helps to maintain that high level than the random. Um, so, so in in a lot of places, I like unless I'm concerned that the behavior may go into extinction, then for sure I have to put it on random schedule. But 
um, I, I seem to, to do a lot of continuous schedule of reinforcement. And that doesn't mean, again, that it's a one type of reinforcer, but the behavior is always attended to. There is, there is a consequence. That's kind of where I am, at least for right now. <laughs> That's a very uh, astute and nuanced answer, and I like your um, I like your caveat there at the end because it, it, you know when we say continuous, these are terms that are established in science, right? And in science, in the in the laboratory, that meant a very particular thing. It meant an aliquot of food, but in real life, when we this has been a theme in the conversation, there are all these reinforcers, and one of the subtle things that is very hard to um, the side about is like, you know, I've been making a big point of the human being becomes right. the reinforcer. You're almost always by definition associated with, with the behaviors and anything you do, whether you smile or you praise or all of those things are reinforcers, especially to dogs for Christ's sake. So right. it's a little bit difficult to not be in a continuous system in it, you know, from a purely uh, oh. absolute standpoint, you know, that, that you'd have absolutely no reaction to, um, to behaviors is pretty rare. Um, so I, I'm, I'm with you in, in that, uh, in that point of view. So what I tend to say is, and this is, you know, I'll, I'll go back and forth between the science and the art. The science says continuous uh, and I, you probably know this, but for the listener, I guess, continuous um, schedules um, are best for uh, perfect uh, identical presentation of behavior. That's what they, so, so like you're describing very well with the down, if you want the down to be exactly the same and totally precise, continuous schedules will, will help maintain the crispness of that. Right. Um, on the other hand, intermittent schedules um, will maintain effort. They will enable, um, you know, because if you promised a payment, you know, uh, all the time, there's a little bit more uh, tension, I suppose, in case you don't, you miss your reinforcer or, um, yeah, the promise of payment is something that can trip up the continuous reinforcement situation in real life. And you can get more modification and more, um, more effort towards getting the behavior. You can get surge effort on right. random schedules plus, uh, or variable schedules. Variable schedules also help you, you know, um, just with uh, extending out your reinforcers uh, from a practical standpoint. Like sometimes I'm working with animals for hours at a time, or I'm working with them in open ocean or something like that, where I can't reinforce every single iteration of the behavior by, because of the practicality of the situation, literally the animal has to do, you know, and I, I can create chains and things, but there are, there's just a practicality to what yeah. the scenario yeah. allows. So um, I like the, I'm, I'm not in either camp. I will say I use continuous when I'm training a novel behavior. So if it's new to the animal, I am using continuous reinforcement. Uh, acquisition, um, yeah. There, yeah. There's, no, there's no question there in my mind. I'm also using continuous reinforcement if this is a behavior that the animal finds inherently quite challenging. Yeah. You know, that the behavior is difficult to perform or the animal doesn't like it or it's painful. Anything that that ranks hard for them, you know, fair pay for fair effort, basically. Where I tend to go into variable is when the animal has an established repertoire, it's back of their head, their you know, easy for them to do. And I want the flexibility of not having to pay for every single thing. I want them to be not so tight that if I miss the reinforcement and also just the flexibility of my work environment, I want to be able to have the animal keep going for long, right. long periods of 
of time. Like horses, it's really important to have variable schedules because you're riding horses. You know, you can't be, um, it, it, you can't be paying at the same temporal frequency all the time. Um, so you, you inherently need to stretch things. And, and, and a lot of the paradigms I worked under, I had to do that. So I kind of go back and forth. And I think some of it is I'm watching the motivation of the animal. But if I'm in some situation like you're describing, that's a competition where I need perfect performance, continuous is your but best I friend. Know. No question. There is one more that just uh, came to me and, and, and this is um, like I, I also would pay attention and basically not, not disturb a behavior that is already self-rewarding by throwing another reward on top of it because now uh, uh, I, I would make the dog expect my ball or cookie instead of enjoying what they are doing at the moment, which they already were doing. And uh, so sometimes the, the reward or the reinforcer that we are adding takes out the, the enjoyment of performing, like, like if I like to, I don't know, play soccer, I just like to play soccer, and I get now money because I'm playing soccer, there is that question now, am I still liking to play soccer or am I looking for the money? Yeah, and, and, uh, and there's a lot of interest in this, uh, you, gosh, that is a hot topic question and it is really difficult because it gets into, if it's if trained behavior, it gets into where it goes from extrinsic reinforcement to intrinsic reinforcement. Right. Right. And how do you know and when do you hand it over? And I mean, that's an art form with people like yourself who have to, you have to sense the this, this shift. And then you can also sense that it can, it, can, um, it can shift back too. The animal can get burned out if you overuse um, yeah. a conditioned reinforcer. So it depends on the situation. Um, I think you have to feel the ratio strain set in before you know, you can feel sort of the slugness if you're, if you're going to use anything, you know, if you're going to stop reinforcing something, you have to, you have to feel where that, where that um, value point is at for the animal. Um, but it's true. If it, if it's got its own uh, intrinsic um, self-confidence in there, then of course, interrupting it with extra reinforcement as a, as a weird um, sidetrack, it doesn't necessarily have to overshadow it, but it can overshadow. Um, I mean, you think about people who, uh, who are professional soccer players, to use your example. Um, professional soccer players get paid to do it, but they still enjoy the game. So we know it can happen that way. Um, but then there is a lot of example of, of there being some, uh, some kind of... Um, It's different incentive, right? It's not like it's not like the kid that can play endlessly. Like the, the professional player plays and likes it, but expects the the reward for playing to where the kid just wants to play. <laughs> he doesn't expect the reward for it. Um no. Right. Um, I'm not sure I would agree. And I think, that, well, we don't have a professional athlete here, right. but I, I can kind of feel the professional athletes on both sides of that story arguing back against that. I think, you know, Michael Jordan still plays basketball. They, people, <laughs> people who love the, love the sport and got into it at that level, they love it, love it. Um, you know, yeah, I agree, I though. The basic principle how long are the training sessions what do you like if we if um with a with a normal young animal you're starting some basic training what is like a how long would a training session go for yeah, that's 
a good question. That so depends um, on the species and the individual and their level of, um, you know, obviously in the beginning, their level of ability to focus their attention is very small. Whereas, you know, the more advanced animals, it's almost a punishment to end the training session for them mm. because they're so into learning and interactions. So um, what determines when to stop? Let's go there. In the, in the beginning, I would say the default answer is many small training sessions. Empirically, that's what is clear. Many small training, many short training sessions. There is another problem with this question, which is to say that, so my perspective is training, animal training is behavior modification brought about through human interaction. Good one. And that definition you'll notice, especially with a domestic animal like a dog involves all the interactions you're doing. They never stop learning just because you've You've turned off your, you know, you're not doing any trick training. You're not trying to train a behavior. It doesn't mean classical conditioning and other uh, associated um, phenomena. The animal's still picking up on reinforcers in its environment all the time. It doesn't clock in and clock out the way that we're describing, quote unquote, training sessions. So it's really, really important to keep that in mind as an animal trainer, that the, that the animal is not clocking in and clocking out. Now, in terms of the intensity of working on a given behavior, if you want to, if, if, that, if that's the capsule that I think you want to put around training session, um, many short training sessions to begin with, then when the animal has the joy of learning, it's almost a punishment to shorten the training session. And... I would ex start extending them out according to their, um, you know, their mental aptitude and interest. And I always try to end before, you know, I feel that coming on or right in the very beginning, you know, if I start to notice there's a sluggishness, oh, maybe we'll switch to another thing because, mm -hmm. you know, you get mm -hmm. tired of some, mm -hmm. some basic right. um, approach. And maybe they still want to work, but they want to do something else. So that, you know, I sometimes will work on multiple things in one session. It, it'll just depend on the animal's um, appetite for the encounter, um, even more than the appetite for the reinforcer. Um, it, it, it's a, it has a lot to do with their, this gets back to relationship. It has a lot to do with where they are in the learning process. If they've learned to love to learn, which is what happens in time, I'm sure you would experience, you would yeah, agree with yeah. that, right? Then, um, then that animal can be worked much, much, much longer. But I still think, um, and, and there's a lot of situations where I have to, in the, in the end, my goal is I have to work with the animal for hours. So I can't, you know, limit their training experiences to always just tiny training sessions because- I I'm going to have to get somewhere and I'm going to have to take approximations to get there. So that might be one of my reasonings. And I think that depends, you know, really what your goal is with the animal. How, how are you going to use this behavior and, and what is the duration cap on that? What about break? And I'm not talking break like the small break within the session, but actual days of no work. Do you, do you use any strategies with that? Because sometimes I, I would, and it happens almost by default with me because if I'm gone like I was just for like two weeks in Hong Kong and I come back and I work with a dog that's already seasoned, a dog that's uh, in a very early stage, just five months old. And I think breaks, I find them sometimes when the dog is in the right place in the break are very, very beneficial for motivation, like it, it really skyrockets for me, but what, what is your take? Do you notice a difference between the seasoned animals and the um, greener animals in terms of that? Um... Yeah, um, probably, yeah, probably the seasoned one is a little bit more, uh, um, more motivated, I would say. Um, 
but I mean, not by much for sure. I think um, um, the younger one and young meaning like, 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 let's say if I have a three, three months old puppy and we barely can play fetch for two minutes, it, it doesn't affect that. But once that puppy already understands that he has that joy of playing fetch, to the point that can get tired and, and really feel good about it. Already, that break, uh, uh, you see, you see them looking, expecting, and being highly motivated and excited that are oh, we gonna do this again? So, um, yeah, once once the the actual games are already established, a break I find that really can can just skyrocket motivation if if needed what, do you have a sense of um how long a break is like is there a difference between a break of a day and a break of two weeks and is there yeah. any duration of break that is too long in your mind like is two months too long of a break or is that you know what i mean yeah like how do you look at that so i've i've, I've gone probably as far as two months and again, just because it, either the dog is injured or I'm gone or something. And up to that point, it's always been a, a very beneficial thing. Um, as a trainer, I feel like, okay, I'm, I should be doing something, I'm behind. But every time there's been a break like this, I always find that I start exactly where I've been, where I left it with a very nice uh, new charge, new mo stronger motivation, stronger desire every time. Um, sometimes even with dogs that, let's say, an exercise or behavior that got, got a little confusing and the dog doesn't quite understand the, the answer and the way out and how how to make it. Um, I also would take a break, for, at least from that behavior, but ultimately I would take, a, I, I would take a, a, a break from everything and then start with the favorite behaviors when there's that desire of high motivation. I reevaluate what was the confusion and hopefully I have the answer so now I can do the right uh, uh, repair um, but yeah, I, for me, again, it's very hard to give breaks, this kind of breaks, because you, you see them, they want to train and I want to train. So it's almost forcing each other not to do anything. But when it happens, when it just happens because of life schedules, it's always been a, a very productive comebacks, always. That's really interesting. So you've never seen a, a disadvantage of the length? No, which I always think that I should. I'm a, almost like sometimes in a panic. Oh, I mean, I, maybe I have a competition or I need to, I'm behind my training for whatever reason. And um, yeah, I, it's an interesting one. And for sure, just as you said, with the relationship, when, when after a break, I'm also coming with the excitement that is very clearly noticeable from the dog. It's like, well, he's back and he really wants to do it. So I, I know we are feeding from each other, and, but it's a very good moment. And I always pay attention to it because it's, I, I use it all the time. When, when it happens, I, I reap all the benefits. Like, I, I don't take it lightly. <laughs> huh. That's, yeah, it's got me. Think well, we had always um, a principle. We called it a rest day um, built yeah. Um, yeah. Once, a once a week for yeah. each animal. So we took a day where we didn't do formal training sessions um, every week. So, you know, yeah. my basic we do. answer is yes. Yeah, we do the same. We do the, we do. I, I all just like with us I, I think we, we all need a break and 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 
but the one day break or two day break even I, I don't know how many more days, but for sure one or two days doesn't create that kind of motivation than, than two weeks of, of not doing it. So I, I noticed when you were describing um, that, it, you know, especially if there's a problem, I, I often did do exactly, you know, I would maybe I would try to solve the problem and I would find that we're just getting deeper into the problem. So taking a long break under those circumstances, shelving the behavior for weeks um, and coming back to it, it was definitely something we did um, with, with the same kind of success. Although that's not to say that we shelved all training uh, for our animals. My animals would have felt, um, yeah, I think almost like a, a kind of depression if right. we went for um, for weeks without any training with them. And I, I think this may be, again, about the definition, because presumably somebody's walking your dogs, you know. Uh, yeah, so yeah, they're, right? So they're, right, right. from my point of view, that's still, they're still engaged. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're and not yeah. like locked in a kennel somewhere just exactly. getting food. Yeah. Yeah, that, I have to make that clear. They're not staying in a crate. Like they, they are still having the run of the house and my wife and my other dogs are, they they're, have 10 acres to run every day. It's just that that one-on-one -on -one interactions missing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, where you're just like focused on this goal. Um, and, and I think that's a very domestic animal kind of situation, whereas in an exotic kind of scenario where often we have to move the animals around, we have to take care of them. So it's not as possible to just completely uh, walk away from that. That is kind of the, the, you know, them being in the house with us. That's, uh, that's a part of how they, they are effectively doing that all the time, shifting, moving. So there's always this kind of thing, but novel behavior training might not occur. Certainly wouldn't occur um, necessarily uh, each day and, and might be, weeks in between any given, with a lot of our animals, we might have many behaviors they're working on. And they, and, and there could be, you know, weeks in between any given behaviors trial. Mm -hmm. um, and I did see, uh, I, I do recognize the effect of what you're describing. I can say, I think that that's the case, that there is a certain amount of, um, uh, you know, refreshed interest, freshness well, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, the other side of it is, and I think the reason that I would tend to not go for months at a time is that, you know, the life of the animal is finite, um, especially for dogs and you're losing months at a time. And in particular, if that's in a critical window, like the learning uh, right. that, that window we're describing up until adulthood where they're establishing who they are. I wouldn't so much want to walk away from them for, you know, those would be very significant chunks of their childhood that I'd be losing important formation time. So I would tend to not do that in the younger animals. And I would tend to feel more confident doing that in animals that, you know, where their, their growth uh, curve is not so dramatic at that point. It's not so critical that I get those foundations into them while they're in that, that moment, you know, I wouldn't, it's okay not to be in school as an adult, but as a child, you might be losing some important right. moments of learning your letters and, you know, learning how to socialize. And, or, or you get yourself in trouble doing, you know, displacing all the energy into the wrong things. But yeah, I mean, uh, uh, again, like I, I, I know that, it helps me, but I have never done it on purpose. Like I just cannot say, oh, we're not going to do anything for two weeks. That's just like <laughs> not, not possible. As a trainer, you know, your dog is looking at you. It's like, well, how, how can that happen? Uh, um, anything that you do as far as uh, like, like uh, I don't know, I mean, I, I did mention, but like, do you, let's just start there. Like, would you tell, do you have a cue of disapproval in training? 
oh, that was the thing I never got back around to. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't have a no reward marker the way you're describing it. Um, but I have something that's very similar. So the, the downside of a no reward marker is it's completely associated with punishment. It means that's it. But I really value being able to tell the animal they're on the wrong track. I don't know why you'd only want to tell the animal when they're on the right track. That's, in fact, I, I often play this game with people where I, I say, okay, you can either play just hot only or you can play right. hot and cold. And which would you prefer? And, and I've never had anyone prefer hot only because you need the information. The, the thing is, is that you want it to be informative and not discouraging. So you you need to take that cue uh, in my mind. This is how I how I worked with it. I needed to take a cue that could inform the animal as a piece of communication about when they were doing something wrong. And yes, the implication of doing something wrong is at least negative punishment. It's at least you're not going to get paid. Um, uh, that's how the cue gets its value. Right. But um, but it needs to not be so discouraging that it suppresses all effort. So the cue that I created um, is called the redirection stimulus. And it's a stimulus that says on this path, it, it, it sets up a, a two choice um, paradigm for the animal. If you continue to repeat the same behavior, you will not get reinforcement. You will effectively get punishment. However, if you change behavior when I cue you with this redirection stimulus, change behavior in any way, you get um, on a variable schedule reinforced. So it's a cue that says change behavior to get to reinforcement. So it, it, uh, it helps reduce the uh, suppressive it, effects uh, of the punisher. What's that? But uh, but it's not asking, it's not suggesting to do that behavior. It's just saying. Uh, um, uh, um, it can be a one, two. So you certainly can. And I often did. No, sit would be a good example. Mm -hmm. um, here's what I want. That's how you can help it conditioned along. Um, the condition, the, one of the problems with this cue um, this cue has a lot of value in a, in a sophisticated person's hands, but it's tricky to condition properly because, um, because people like to just say no. And if you say no a bunch of times um, without realizing that you need to reinforce for the change of behavior, you can become quite suppressive. Um, you know, no, 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 no. It's not, yep. it reduces the motivation of the animal a lot. Um, but I found this to work very well in a lot of paradigms, paradigms that might actually reflect some of the type of work that you do. There are many times where I needed to stop an animal on its tracks. You know, if it, if it was about to do something that was dangerous to me or to it, I needed to let them know that there was going to be a repercussion of that, um, of that action. And I really wanted them to pay strong attention. So the um, the flip of it is like it's a, one of the classic ways I would show this off is I would start to hand the animal a fish, a food reward, and I would use the redirection stimulus. So they would be reaching forward for the fish. I would say, nope. And they would pause or they would look away or they would go into the water because I had conditioned this. Yep. Um, yep. And as soon as and they would do that with so much eagerness and crispness, it would make you proud, I think. Yep. And, and and what do they receive in, in response to having done that? Tons of fish. Right. One fish on the one hand versus tons of fish on the other hand. And so you get a very crisp response. They're listening for that information. because well, they're they using it as a guidance. Yeah. Yeah. It's a guide. It's, it's, it's something that says the, the re you will not get reinforcement continuing this way. You will, in fact, get punishment. You'll get negative reinforcement or maybe even more than, than that. Sorry, right. you will get negative punishment. I said the wrong thing. You will get negative punishment or even positive punishment if you continue down that track. Um, but the other side is switch behavior quickly, reinforcement. Even if it's not the exact behavior I'm looking for, we'll work on that in a minute. 
Right. Um, you can always you can always cue the behavior you're looking for, but what you want is this crisp reaction to the redirection stimulus. And, and in that sense, as long as you maintain the reinforcement side of the redirection stimulus, um, it worked very well. It works very well for me and, and my animals. I actually did do an experiment where I, I looked at training with only the bridge stimulus or training with the bridge stimulus and the redirection stimulus. And the learning curve was so much faster. I mean, I, I could cut more, it in. More clarity. Yeah. A lot of people don't like this because there does have to be a, uh, at least a negative punishment repercussion um, to really crisp this, this, uh, the information. There has to be, there has to be a consequence to not listening to the redirection stimulus, which in my case was often walking out. I would just walk out. So like if you, to make the distinction between being positive or negative, Punisher and redirection. It's basically that your redirection involves a penalty, but includes guidance to what's next. Is that the difference? Or are or you asking about the um, the initial training of it, or are you asking? No, not the training. Just the just yeah, just the the like. So we have a punishing. Punisher, which means you, 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 something, whatever, if it's negative or whatever, but we're stopping a behavior in the one that you call, um, oh, no, no, I forgot what, no, redirection. The Re reason I'm calling it a redirection stimulus redirection is because it, it's differential reinforcement of other behavior is what's right. happening. But you so are I, I set up a contingency that says, do anything other than that, and you're going to get paid initially. That's what it is. Yeah, they're, they have, you, have to, you have to have a consequence to if they continue. Because you could have differential reinforcement and never, and, and really just try to deflect the dog with, or, or the sea lion without ever knowing. The sea yeah, lion. but with a without cue, ever you actually knowing. tell them. Go ahead. But that's kind of like, like when, when a lot of trainers use differential reinforcement, the idea would be, Okay, there is the undesired behavior. We're not gonna tell you that it's a bad behavior. Don't do it, that is dangerous for you. We're just gonna really focus on what else to do. And that would be a, a, a form of typical differential reinforcement. That's a lesser version of what I do, as right. I would put it. Right. I mean, I just add a key in there. Yeah, it because it, it says, hey, this I don't like what you're doing, or this is dangerous for you, or whatever. So you really bringing a more well-rounded education to bad idea, good idea. Yes. Right. And I'm trying to make it clear in the, in the exact second when they're doing it. So right. I can use it when they're actually learning. So they're, they're, in, they're in some process of learning and I can go, not that lift, don't lift your foot, put that down. And then as soon as they start anything but lifting it, they get paid. So now, right. you know, now they're listening for the information. I can tag the exact moments of the behavior that are wrong. And if their mind is on the part of their body that I was uh, talking about, they're going to really quickly connect what the parameters to know how to do something. You both have to know how to do it and what it isn't. That's both sides of it. Yeah. And it's uh, tricky though. It's tricky to train, maybe not for you. I think it would be very easy for you to train or you probably use something very I think similar. we are doing, uh, we are doing the, same, the same approach for sure. Um, unless, unless it's something that, um, okay, well, sometimes there is, um, I don't know, like, like sometimes there would be just a very natural way of how you do you you touch a hot stove and and nobody needs to tell you don't do it again nobody needs to tell you do this instead you just learn not to touch the hot stove so there is there is situations and times where the dog could learn from experience which they do anyway without without redirection i don't believe that every single time we need to say don't do this and do this instead there is times where it can be very simple just as i said with the stove it's like you just yeah don't don't do it 
do do whatever else you want to do, and it doesn't need it doesn't lead to a, a reinforcement necessarily. But that's a bad idea. But yeah, are, I'd rather my are, kids don't get burned on stoves. So my general strategy would be to explain, right? Don't touch the stove, and then. When they touch the stove, they won't be that surprised. If they decide they're going to touch the stove or they accidentally touch the stove, they don't think, oh, the world has come to an end. And actually, that's how, you know, those animals that get random, the worst type of punishment in the world, because touching the stove is a punishment. The worst type of punishment in the world is random punishment. That's the one that's associated with all the bad outcomes. Non-contingent. Correct. And this is where all the studies are done to to show. This is the problem. If you expect this if you have every reason to understand that there is you speed and there is a speeding ticket penalty or whatever that is you're not that shocked and nor are you that traumatized no. by that it's very similar to what i said to you earlier about the um the loud noise realizing that the gunshot is effectively random punishment to that animal that is blown out by it the the, the better scenario is to go there's going to be a loud noise you know, once you start to understand, the more understanding you have about why things are happening, the less random they are, the less non-contingent, as you said, the more the more clarity the animal has, they're armed to understand they won't find it quite so um, uh, traumatizing. And that's what we're looking for. Right. We don't want to traumatize them. There's no use of traumatiz- traumatizing. We want meaning in, in the environment to be as clear as possible. Yeah, that's how I feel. No, no, that's exactly that's a super, super good point. Um, I mean, no, that that was perfect. Um, what about the what about the least reinforcing scenario? That's something in in your in your marine world, and, and that's a a hot like. People you must swear. have a very high-end audience if you can throw out that term without without even explaining it. <laughs> well done, but, listeners. So it's basically okay for those that don't know. It's a it's a like a it's a what you would call like probably the most positive way that you will try to deal with uh, undesired behaviors, right? And there is a so. There is like a, I don't know, was it like two to four seconds of, of a neutral response and then you, you know, you kind of disrupt uh, the rhythm of, of whatever. The, 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 the reinforcement that the, I, I always think of dog, but you disrupt, then you wait for that break and then you throw a reinforcer to, to kind of re-engage back with you. The, um, the, the criterion associated with it as, as I was taught it, or as I teach it, um, least reinforcing scenario, two to three second period of no response from the trainer, followed by reinforcement on a variable, uh, frequency for calm default attention. So the animal, it, it basic, no response from the trainer becomes a cue for calm default attention which is an important one. You want, a, you want a calm default attention. And I like having no response be a calm default. Uh, calm default is not a, it's not like a, you're not really looking for eye contact or any, anything. You're really looking, it, it, that's the. Yeah, calm default attention does mean the animal has to be paying attention directly to the trainer, not moving around. I mean, it will be different depending on the species. For me, with a dog, it would be them having to make eye contact. Oh, know, yeah. And they'd have to be looking at me. But putting that to the side, do I use it? Yes. Um, I I actually use it with my redirection stimulus. So the the when I'm first training the redirection stimulus, the problem with it is the animal has to notice you're doing it. and And that's... Because it's silent, it's sort of, you know, without a cue associated with it, it's, it's a little bit, a right. lot of animals miss it. Um, and also, I think because it doesn't give them the positive opposite, the, um, you know, what I like about the redirection stimulus is it is like, 
It's not like, no, you screwed up. Okay, well, we can go on. It's like, just shift, you know, shift now, shift on the fly. You know, my animals actually are looking to hear the redirection stimulus because it helps them get to their jackpot faster. Right, right. Um, whereas nobody really wants to experience the least reinforcing scenario because it always, it, you know, it can, it can come, there are famous stories of killer whales doing this where, you know, they've, they've just gone off on some giant chain behavior of three huge jumps and they weren't supposed to do that jump. And then they come back and they get nothing. They get told effectively, um, no, by this method. And maybe they'll get something for uh, sitting with calm default attention, but still they've wasted a lot of energy. If you could have interrupted the misunderstanding in the middle of that big jump sequence, so they didn't waste all that energy doing something you didn't want, right. it would have been a lot more um, uh, cost effective for both of you is how I feel. And, and there have been some very classic examples of animals becoming really aggressive after getting LRSs because they learn that, you know, they've just wasted all their time. So I prefer not allowing my animal to practice a big wrong thing at the end of which going. Right. But it, uh, isn't it the L LRS really the, 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 the whole purpose, the reason is to avoid to say, no, that's the wrong direction. Yeah, but, it is, it is but that. To, but to kind of just, uh, manage it in some magical way that uh, like I've, I've tried to to see like like I, I've seen it maybe twice uh, um, and twice is nothing so I'm going by pure logic of, of how it would work and and it's just very difficult it, it, it's you're living it too up to the animal to come to this conclusion that they may or may not come and most likely they will not come to that, oh, this is why this is happening. I've been kind of stopped by doing what I wanted to do. They come to, I mean, I, I use this tool all the time, so I don't want to, I don't want to suggest I don't use it. I use it all the time. It's sort of, it, you know, it's a, it's a reset button. Reset is a different, yeah. Reset is a very different thing, though. You, you, I, I will still say, hey, this is why we're resetting. Yeah. Well, I'm a communicator, too, so I tend in that direction as well, though not every single thing. You did make the point that not everything needs to get feedback, right, earlier. The touching the hot stove sure. tells its own story. And, and this um. is maybe... Um, you know, to avoid, the, I think some of, some of this is about, you can accidentally reinforce the behavior if you, if you respond too much, um, depending on how much the animal gets out of the interaction with you. So the, for example, there's a lot of parrots and, and a lot of animals that just by paying attention to them, you're rewarding them. And so it can be very difficult. And that must be true also with dogs. It can be very difficult to, um, work with giving feedback in the middle of an incorrect response that can actually sort of push that, that response forward. So uh, it has to be done with, I, th I think, that level of sophistication. I usually give people a kind of general guideline. I think other people do. I wouldn't use, if you're finding you need to use an LRS more than three times in a training session, Stop and rethink what you're doing. In right. fact, that's true of the redirection stimulus too. I don't want somebody overusing the redirection stimulus, although I personally probably do use it more than three times in a training session. Um, and sometimes I've done that unwisely. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's, I think these techniques are useful to, um, to give a nice edge to, to the situation, but the, but the, but the win is really in the antecedent arrangement, setting the animal for, for success. So they, yeah. you know, yeah. mostly, mostly they're on the right track. And then, um, the, the LRS is maybe if you don't know what to do in your processing, this might be a good first response, um, rather than inadvertently re reward the behavior by jumping into it and accidentally, 
uh, miscommunicating to, especially to a domestic animal, that uh, your attention um, might be positive to them. Do you feel they? Do you feel they can start to to understand? I, and well, I, I don't know. It's not a punishment, but we can call. They punishment. definitely understand it. I mean, they understand it enough that I've I've watched animals be violently aggressive at the end of an LRS because they understand that they've just wasted their Interesting. time. Interesting. Or or can it happen the other way also to where they they go to that almost purposefully so they can get that uh, um, reinforcement of for for neutral response. Would that happen too or no? Well, would that happen or no? That can, that could happen, and that's why it does have to be on a variable strategy. Um, you know, you're, it's not a, it's not a continuous uh, schedule. So I think you have to decide on the basis of the motivational particulars in the situation whether that's something you want to reinforce for. Um, how regularly is the animal defaulting to the wrong behavior in order to get the just, I prefer calm default. Um, also, you have to train a calm, you should train a calm default um, as, a, as a foundational um, go-to. I mean, that's, that's what I want my animal to do if they don't know. I want them to calm default so that we can both reset, you know, and that is a hard thing to train. It also trains a lot of emotional kind of self-control. So there's a lot of benefits in within that system that maybe we're not kind of giving it credit for a little bit. It, it implies mm -hmm. training this, this important kind of wait and, you know, look for more information from the trainer kind of attitude to the learning experience that I think is very good. Um, I like giving precise markers because I'm, I like right. communication. Yeah, I would do. I I'm kind of the same way. Like, like I um, like I would, I I would have a very hard time to do this, calm or, or neutral. As a reset, as a reset for me will be, I, I'll tell you that we are resetting. And let's let's come here and reset, and I'll kind of guide you to a reset because, I feel like, by doing this uh, neutral response. I'm, I'm really leaving you alone and I don't want to leave you alone when it's difficult for you. I'm like, come here, let's start over right here, you know? Yeah. Well, there's something very kindly about that attitude, I think. And I generally agree. But then there is, you know, in real time, and maybe dogs are a little bit um, easier this way. A lot of our, a lot of the exotic animals are so hyperactive that you really do need them to learn how to sit still. Mm. Um, mm. they need to learn how to sit still to get more information. If you're constantly having to micromanage them, you're basically doing it for them and they never become um, able to uh, wait for more information. And waiting for more information yeah. is a very valuable attitude to take oh, on. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. It's, it's actually priceless to have because you... you yeah, it, it, like we... I don't know when we train. It's almost like the, the whole training has a, a beat, a rhythm to it, to where it's not all go, go. There is, a, there is definitely a pause. And then there's like, okay, what's going to be next? Maybe we don't know. Maybe we need to look at each other. Maybe we have to interact now. And then the next thing comes, instead of sit down, come toy, heal, like all this, like a big just action, action, action to where the moment there is no action, there is a big concern all of a sudden, like this isn't, I don't know what to do. I cannot function. Why are we not? Yeah, like anxiety. Right, right. Yeah. Um, hmm, interesting. I had, a, I had a sea lion baby um, who was really aggressive. And uh, she had been handled, she had, she went through rehab multiple times. So she would have had lots of needles, lots of traumatic early life medical experiences. And so she just really did not like human beings when she started. And she was all, you know, a, attack and spitfires and everything like this. And, and the other side of this is that she kind of had that, she just has a, had a naturally um, anxious personality. 
when she went, you know, once we had worked through all of that and she had um, uh, learned how great we could be and, and she learned to, um, she learned to, to train. In fact, she was one of the animals that really loved playing Frisbee. She would play Frisbee through the fence infinitely long. No one could ever exhaust this animal. She'd just do it forever. Um, that was after, you know, that was when she decided human beings were okay. And we had spent a lot of careful time being very respectful and kindly towards her. Anyhow, um, we used a lot of calm default. We used a lot of LRS and, and basically, um, it became for her like an anchor where she would get so upset when she was not understanding what we wanted because she really liked to know and she really liked to learn and she liked to be the best at it, you know? And so if it wasn't exactly right and she wasn't, you know, getting the feedback that it was perfect and stuff like that, she'd get frustrated and you could, you know, she would like flip or stomp and you could see her just, her breathing rate would increase and you could just feel the tension on the animal and leaving would not have helped that much because that would just leave her with this failure, right? So of course you could switch to something else and use, you know, behavior momentum, but she really did want to be able to succeed. And, and so one of the best things that she, she learned to do in the course of using this type of a tool was she learned that when she was frustrated, if she dropped into the calm default, she was a winner and she could always be a winner. Um, and she could be proud of that. And so when she started to feel, this is actually part of my mindfulness training. This was the thing was that she learned how to control her emotions and she learned to be proud of that being, being, uh, able to do it. So she might not know, but she could do this and you watch her and she'd go, "Ah," and then she'd go, Oh, I know. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And she would do that with so much joy and pride. It was amazing to watch her. It was amazing to watch her choose how she could control herself. So that's an example of, um, and that animal is still to this day, one of the best learners, the most enthusiastic, most motivated animals. Um, and they went through this whole arc, you know, of, of being basically afraid, terrified, hating people. So was it with one person? Was it like, a, did you, was it one person that she warmed up with? originally or or how how did you guys approach it like was it like really one one on one or was it few trainers at the same time that how did you gain the trust um because uh because an exotic animal like that is does not live in your house you have to have more than one trainer Um, but we did have i mean i was her primary trainer yeah in the critical period extremely Uh Um, so let's say 85% of her yeah. training would have been done with me. And then there was one or two other extremely capable, regular people, uh, my partner in particular, who would have been working in, you know, you can also create a disability if you only make one person because right. then they don't flex to that next person. So Um, so we did that, but they would be doing lesser things. They wouldn't be working the novel behavior. They would be working whatever I had kind of already set up or just, you know, come bearing gifts is one of my big strategies. So with her, it was a lot of non-contingent reinforcement, pay first, ask questions later. It was, uh, keeping at a distance, trying to keep our movements unthreatening, we, um, we did not do any vaccinations. We did not do any force procedures. Um, and we very quickly trained for the things that in case we had to do anything medically, like I presents, we did in protected contact. So she felt more uh, safe. We brought in the, the veterinarians a million times just to do nothing but feed yeah. her and walk away. People wearing all the dummy gear, um, for a very, very long time. I mean, it just happened for long periods of time and, uh, rewarding all the smallest tries. That's the other thing, you know, just really cherishing every moment she succeeded, but we had to draw a lot of sharp lines. There were many times I had to walk away on that animal. Um, and there were many times I had to protect myself too. So a lot of her initial training was, was quite from a distance. Wow. 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 That's super that's like a, I mean, it's a interesting challenges. How often did you have 
or she was like really one of the most extreme ones. So, I mean, is it often that they they, they get aggressive or or? Yeah, I would say sea lions in general are pretty close to closer to the wolf than the dog. <laughs> Remember what I told you about how to touch them. People yes, have this idea yes. that, that touching sea lions can't be a reinforcer. A lot of professional sea lion trainers or professional marine mammal trainers will tell you, no, uh, touching sea lions isn't reinforcing. Except I can show you uh, videos of me with no food, no training session, just out there scrubbing my sea lions. So how is that the case? It's the case because um, millions of, of iterations of uh, yeah. classical conditioning went into it. Um, so yeah, I, they're, they're pretty, um, they're pretty aggressive when you first, uh, get to know them. Most of them, you know, over 50%, this one was particularly bad because she had been handled a lot. Um, and, uh, hmm. I think what's very important is cause you get a lot of fear biting in sea lions. Um, and it's mostly from handling. It's from people pushing, uh, the physical touching too soon. Um, or pushing the veterinary procedures on the animals and them just having these really early life uh, traumatic experiences that, that color the way they think about humans in general. Wow. So they, wow. This is a... Uh, I, I need to, this, I'm going to be thinking about this for four days. I, I'm telling you, this is just so, I have to tell so you, though, interesting. It's an absurd amount of work. I mean, you know, it took a village of people. We're not talking about a dog at your house. This is like me and 20 right. other people. And it must be frustrating and sad at the same time because all of you are trying to make the thing feel good. And, and probably it's, it's a, you see a lot of progress pretty quickly. Like, actually, I have some great videos. Some, so in our next conversation, I'll, I'll at some I point, I'll send you some to. videos so you can see the progression of going from like attacking and biting to, um, you know, to learning the bridge and learning the target. Right. And once you start getting some sense of um, communication going, everything kind of shifts around because no longer is everything, it's going back to this idea of the randomness. If they can't understand anything, they're suspicious of everything. But once they start to have an understanding that there is clarity in this individual, that they mean what they say, that they can trust the contingency. So this is, I, in a sense, you know, uh, this is really where you want that. Um, and then also probably giving them some some sense of, of meaningful life, like a purpose, something. So they're not just like, okay, what am I doing? Like, you know, giving them some, some sense, okay, I, I'm somebody, I have a, a purpose, right, fulfillment, right? That, I think that's a very big, big part of, of coming kind of together. Yeah. I think this is one of the most important reasons why people should deliberately train animals. Training is uh, mental health care. Right. Um, it gives it gives an animal in captivity and managed care it gives them something to uh, strive towards. We've taken away most of their basic need, you know, the, the things that they would have had in the wild, staying away from predators, finding food, finding mates. We've we've eliminated all that. We need to supply something to right. do because they are still genetically have the need to perform all these things. Right. But it's the same with the dogs, it's the same with humans, it's the same, I guess, with everybody. Otherwise, we wouldn't have survived, right? That we're, we're, not, we're not genetically um, wired to uh, sit around and do nothing. That wouldn't right. have been a survival characteristic. So this that is would a, be a dead animal. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, this is kind of my concern where, where uh, the like in, in the dog training and dog just owning a dog, it's becoming, you know, animal rights and I don't know who else, but restricting and thinking that dog sports are, you know, all dog sports have an element of, of you know, not being fair and some, some abuse, but abuse can happen without 
we doubt that. But, but I really think that if we don't have outlets for the dogs, like a greyhound not to chase a lure, or a husky not to run, or, or a malinois not to do what malinois does, but we still have them, the shelters will be full with dogs. I mean, we will have so many problems without people not... And, and, and on top of that, when you, when you train a dog for some sport, being agility, being fly ball, whatever you want, but doing something with the dog, the relationship that you and I have been talking all day long just goes on a very different place than walking on a flexi around the block and feeding it the best dog food that you can think of and sitting on the couch all day. That, that sense of, of like, like contribution even. Yeah, I agree. To, I agree completely. I think that being able to continue to grow your whole life long is a very satisfying mental place to be. And to the extent that you, you basically stagnate, um, it's not good for a person nor for an animal. Um, right. I, think, I think that it's what keeps you young. It's what keeps you engaged. It reduces fear. It helps you be resilient. Um, I think finding a way to do that in a healthy way is one of the best. I mean, there's all sorts of evidence of that in human beings, you know, doing puzzles, right. doing Yes. Doing challenges keeps your mind going. And um, the, this is the same basic uh, hardware, but that, you know, we're both mammals. This is, you know, we're just two different branches of the same tree. And, and that sort of fulfillment um, is really important. It involves critical systems that help your whole body stay in, um, in a good, calm state. You know. Yeah, I don't know why why we're headed that way though, to where um, we we really think that a dog should just have, you know, have food and have place to walk and and they should be happy and and when you think about even I mean humans I mean the, you my best friends are people that I do things with. You know, being sports, being being anything, but um, I don't know. That that's a that's something that I I really don't know where it's coming from. Um, I don't know how is it with the marine worlds and like with like how much do you get? Like how, how, how much do they want you to stop doing what you're doing basically? Is there, is there a pressure on you as a marine world or, or, or even, even if it's not for, you know, actually sea world, even if it's for a good cause, is there still a pressure of just interacting and training with, with animals or no? I think there's a misunderstanding about what training is. Again, I want to point out that training is all of the interactions where the animal's behavior is modified through interaction with the person. So can that be established um, at an intense level in a competition? 100%. Could it be in other ways, other healthy ways? Can, it, can a dog be happy at home on, on walks and things like that? Of course they can. Um, but, but I'm an advocate that we deliberately, you know, I think <laughs> I'll say something radical, but I think it wouldn't be so terrible if people had to have like certificates to own pets mm. and that they had to understand how to condition them for healthy, happy lives, like how to walk them without choking them and, um, you know, how to make yeah. sure they have recalls and how to make sure they know how to go to kennels and that they're not barking like crazy when you leave the house and all the things that end up associated with kind of the companion animal uh, problems, because there's a lot of companion animal problems out there where people are just sort of um, carelessly training their animals. Yeah. 
Um, they're flooding them. They're doing all sorts of unhealthy training techniques, um, traumatizing them with sudden visits to the, to the veterinarian that haven't been prepared for, or vacuum cleaners, or the, the, you know, there's all right, these right. things that could be done better. And that, that's true of the uh, common horse and dog owner. And it, you know, it's less true of the professional because the professionals pretty much have this in their mind. And so, you know, if I look at which sets of animals are healthier, it's by far the animals in, in professional care. Um, the, the, the real problem animals are the animals that are coming out of someone's home where they've blown them out and done stuff that, or they've just left them to languish Right. Um, in depression and, and separation anxiety or uh, fear from um, overexposure to stimulus. And that happens a lot in both dog and horse. So that's the place where people like you and I have to leverage our understanding of training and also explain that training is happening all the way through the life of the dog. This is, this is technology that we have to bring to bear all the time. From the dog's point of view, it's not distinguishing the competition from the dog walk. Those are the same. They're engagements with the person. And the question is, I mean, I'm not saying they're the same, like the animal um, has the same experience, but they could be the same on the, you know, when I walked my dog, I did all kinds of training in the park. I was doing all sorts of agility and random requests of sudden downs and all this kind of stuff, because I wanted that experience to be very alive and very right, um, right. yes exactly if you if you you can certainly do that but that's kind of what i what i mean by doing sports or, or any kind of tasks is the giving the dog some challenges that that can and good good challenges exactly that they succeed and bring makes them excited makes them confident makes them yeah so so you certainly can do that going to a park absolutely um um yeah it's not so there is a big pushback on right. in our industry right I, I i never answered your question but there is a big pushback and i think where it really scares me is that it will it will harm the animals ultimately where we won't be able to um we won't be able to care for them properly. There's a big uh, feeling in general that only natural behaviors are what the animals should be exhibiting. But the thing is, is that they're not in the wild. They're in yeah. a managed care situation. We've taken care of their basic needs. What we need to do now is what we've done for human beings, which is allow them to develop and cultivate themselves to a higher level. And they can do that. They can understand language. They can understand very elaborate, very complex behavior. And they find it satisfying, just like people do, um, because their basic needs are already met. So this is where we can help right. them almost like evolve as individuals towards um, their fullest potential. And that is done through learning. Um, it's not done through just leaving them alone and, and uh, disrespecting their potential by leaving them um, kind of uh, languishing in right. in uh, nothingness. Yeah, I think it's sad to have this attitude. Or it's very um, diminutive towards animals, but I know a lot of animals and I know how incredible they are and how sophisticated they are and how much potential they have. And I would hate for them to have that potential limited. It reminds me of how people used to treat women in like 400 years ago or something, you know, like they were stupid or something and they couldn't contribute yeah. to society. Um, I mean, it's a weird analogy. So No, 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 no. no. This, I mean, we can go with a lot of analogies like this. It's like a, uh, there, there is a potential and you're just letting it rotten because it's it's the worst thing it really is, it is the worst thing oh. and you're setting them up for fear and all this other stuff too and anxiety i'll tell you what most of the problems that people have with animals is because they're not taking care of their natural need to express species specific species relevant behaviors right um cats is the famous one where you see that all the time you know i mean because somebody's having a problem with a cat it's it's trapped in a house, unable to do all the cat things. Right. He wants you to, to scratch. Create, <laughs> yeah, you need, you need to create a jungle gym of places right. to hide and jump from and all the things that 
you know, that really stimulate the animal so that they can work that their, their needs out. Um, and with horses, it's going to be like, they're stuck in a little stall and they're cribbing on, on the, the wood pe- you know, they oh, just sit yeah. there and gnaw, yeah. you know, and, and with dogs, you know, I and you dogs can see it in their eyes, eyes, in their expression. It's just so. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. And I have a dog that lives next to me that just barks, you know, for four hours at a time when the, when the owners leave, because they've got terrible separation anxiety and, you know, that dog isn't being left uh, for a better situation. That dog going into a training program like yours would be a totally different, a totally different being. Right. You know? Which one of the, all the animals you have interacted is most difficult to get any rapport with, like, a, like generally speaking? Well, I mean, definitely the, the lower down the evolutionary trail you go, the, the less that's going on there. Um, animals that are not socially complex, that, that in their lives they, they don't interact with others, um, they don't raise their young, so reptiles. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not dissing all reptiles. Certainly, it's possible to train reptiles, and people do. And it depends, you know, like they those Galapagos turtles that live for 100 years. Those are completely different animals than you know than a box turtle or something like that. Um, so those animals, you know, like are a snake that eats once a, every two weeks, <laughs> right. something like that, you know. The, the, it can and be much harder also to have lower emotions. lower expectation too. Um, I'm sorry, say it again. From from snakes, we we yeah we have different criteria and expectations, I guess too. We kind of accept the fact that they they you know they're snake. They have a different interest in life, um, but. I'm always trying to push the edge. So mm. I want them to learn to get in their crate. I want them to learn to, I, I teach them a bridge stimulus. You know, all of those things are possible. With I've never met a species. One of my first species I worked with was praying mantis insects. Um, you know, I don't know if we had a bond, but we had a bridge stimulus. We had a target. I came bearing beetles. You know, I had goldfish training. A lot of negative reinforcement with goldfish. Run away from the pencil was mm. a very straightforward thing you could do with a goldfish. It was always my joke. But, you know, you, if you look, you can see very elaborate fish training going on. But you, your question was, you know, where the relationship was maybe not as important or, you know, right. it, it's harder to develop a rapport. I think it's harder to develop a rapport with shorter lived, um, you know, animals that don't have a lot of social uh, interaction. Um, and the more sophisticated the animal is, you know, you get up there with a, with an elephant, uh, you know, a wolf, uh, um, that kind of, uh, complex, uh, being the sky's the limit. I think you could, yeah. you could do anything. Like I said, I've got videos of asking, <laughs> asking animals to do voluntary to 19 voluntary injections in their mouth so that somebody can come in and slice a tooth out. So I know. It, I remember like when you, when you gave me that example, I remember Casey, she, she, she was telling me about something with the, uh, I don't know, was it wild pigs or some kind of pigs or boar or something. And they were doing um, like the artery that goes to the heart, some, some, some crazy blood sample. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it was the vena cave. Uh, or the uh, yeah jugular jugular and, and she was explaining she she made it like you know I mean made them comfortable and and pretty quickly it wasn't like a some months. they really wanted the milk or whatever was in her she had a milk bottle that she used as bait okay and they would sit there and drink out of this bottle and then they just became desensitized to the touch. And a lot of the fear in, in the, in the stick is not, you know, the actual pressure of the needle and stuff for animals that are used to banging into each other. Right. It's not actually the, the pain of that. The problem is mostly about the, the rodeo that goes on to hold the animal down. 
So um, a few systematic desensitization steps, very carefully prepared while the animal's happily drinking away. Yeah, and she could do it with one hand. She just... Crazy. Wow. So once you're in England, you, you're still going to be coming back to the States sometime, right? Because I, I really would want to like like do some hands-on stuff at some point somewhere well if you're inviting me to your ranch or to one of your clinics you know i i i can see a future for that i think that would be really fun um i would Um, love to understand uh more of your techniques and uh you can help me edit my next iteration of animal training 101 that that would be super yeah we can do so i will send you an invite (laughs) We will definitely make this happen, and um, yeah, I, I know, I know the um, there will be there will be interest to do something like this because uh, yeah, this kind of collaboration is always like looking from from different angles and having different minds observing and. Only good things come from that. So, yeah, I feel like the the um, movement that I do between trainer training systems between species has really helped me think outside the box for difficult to solve problems. Um, it's amazing what people who are at the top of their game um, are doing in terms of the art form, and I'm sure. Uh, Without knowing very much, uh, but I have seen videos of you. I'm sure you're in that category. So I think we w- we would have a lot to share. It's like the blind men and the elephant story. You know, each person knows their part, and exactly. then the whole elephant is defined by getting as much of a different sense of of the different <clears throat> component. Thank you, Jennifer. This was a, a super conversation. Anyone try this book? If you don't have it, um, you can find it on Amazon. Yes, yeah, it, it's one of my uh, recommended book for for the school. Um, so there, there is. Um, I have several books, and this is definitely one of them. So hopefully, all the the moving is smooth and and everything. And um, yeah, I'll 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 stay in touch. We'll we'll organize something and and then probably we have one live one-on-one podcast after we do some training and working together that would be so oh cool. that would be so exciting how cool exactly. i really hope i really hope we do that i will make I really it hope happen. We do that, Ivan. i promise every okay. time i said it so thank yeah, you because you, you and i could sit here and talk for hours and hours i, I don't know how much the audience wants to listen to it i know God imagine Imagine if when we start actually doing hands <laughs> that that's what's about. Okay, Jennifer, thank you. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be in touch. Very, very much appreciate you. Okay, me too. Be well, be happy. Thanks for listening. Take care.